I'd like to call to order the June 12, 2017 meeting of the Highland Park Board of Education. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting setting forth the time, date, and location to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and posted on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the evening. Linda, can we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Here. Ms. Simaresti? Here. Ms. Gowan? Mr. Krieger? Here. Mr. Magaziner? Here. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Ms. Pietrabono? Here. Ms. Richardson? Here. Mr. Roslowitz? Here. Be it resolved, pursuant to the Sunshine Act and JSA 10-4-12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss the student discipline, personnel lit litigation, superintendent's evaluation, and negotiations. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 10-4-13. Information regarding the board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Can I get a motion to uh, convene to closed session? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we convene to regular workshop ses session, please? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, can we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Flag is up there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, everybody bear with us while we have a couple of business items to get out of the way before we get to, uh, to our awards this evening. Uh, let's see, Linda, do we have any other communications other than what's on the board? On the um, agenda, brother? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And then for the minutes um, from the regular and public and executive sessions from May 15th, 2017, did anybody have any questions, concerns about them? Have a chance to look at them? Any thoughts? No? Okay. Uh, and we're not, this is just our workshop meeting, so we're not going to uh, vote on those tonight. So if anybody does have any questions or concerns, um, you can bring them to my attention or uh, Scott's attention before next week. Uh, and that brings us, Lillian, to the student representative report. Okay. I only have the high school. It's a song. That doesn't sound like it. Doesn't sound like it. Um, I only have the high school section of the student report, but girls track has been very accomplished this year. Woo! Woo! Um, yeah. And they'll be letting the national students in. All right. Um, uh, the senior trips were Thursday and Friday, and Thursday night was the boat trip, and Friday we all went to Jordan Park. Um, I love the trip. I think a lot of the other seniors did too. Finals start on Wednesday and continues through Monday. And then there is graduation next Wednesday evening, and graduation, graduation, graduation will be following. Fabulous. Yay. Can you believe it's like this close? <laughs> <laughs> Neither can we. Um, all right, so that's it for the student report for this week, and so we'll move on to Dr. Taylor's report. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, one of the greatest times of the year because it's an opportunity for us to bring out all the fantastic professionals we have in the school district. So I'm going to take the podium and uh, introduce some of the administrators who are here who are going to in turn introduce the uh, honorees, special guests in the audience, and their families. The first, uh, the first group I would like to honor is, um, are those uh, teachers and support professionals who received recognition uh, for being the most outstanding uh, of their peers this year. And uh, so with that, I'd like to have uh, Ms. Freeborn, Kelly Freeborn, come to the podium and talk a little bit about her honorees. Little logistics. Kaya, oh, is Kaya? Kaya, I just saw you. Come on up, you're first up. This is Kaya Schlesinger. She is our Teacher of the Year at Irving. I'm going to make her stand up here while I say wonderful things. 
Okay. So tonight's my pleasure to speak about Irving's Teacher of the Year, Kaya. Kaya has worked as an ESL teacher at Irving for a year. When we were looking for an ESL teacher, she arrived at her doorstep and we immediately knew we needed her at Irving. We called Scott like we need her <laughs> yesterday. Um, on top of, you know, she comes with the years of experience and expertise that she's brought to the district. On top of her obligations as a teacher, she's also the vice president and president-elect of uh, New Jersey TESOL. She's an advocate for ELL students and works tirelessly to get them programming that they need. Kaya is a lifelong learner. She came from a middle school and walked into a primary school. For many people, this would be a challenge. <laughs> Kaya jumped in and learned all she could about how kids learn at this age and more importantly, how to support them. She constantly is reaching out to her contacts, gathering resources and ideas and best practices. Kaya isn't afraid of a challenge. If you met Kaya, you know that status quo isn't the answer. There's, there has to be a better way. This year she provided 15 hours of training to the Irving teachers on sheltered instruction. She created presentations, thoughtful activities, and tailored the training to each grade level. She wrote a grant for blocks for our playground that's tied into our work with Responsive Classroom. Kai has also done a great deal of work learning and studying our curriculum so she can utilize it with her students. Kaya is a nurturer. She cares for all the students. She is warm, welcoming, and kind. It takes a certain person to coax a non-English speaking child out of the bathroom the first week of school. Then, Get him to smile when he finally sees a character in a book he knows. Kaya is knowledgeable about students' cultures and does her best to make them feel settled in a new environment. To say that Kaya is a great teacher would be an understatement. She's a leader, an innovator, and a scholar. Highland Park has gained another strong educator. Congratulations, Kaya. <laughs> Shannon, you don't have to sit down yet. Come on over. <laughs> so I'm proud to introduce our Educational Service Professional of the Year. This is Anna Shannon. Anna is our school social worker. Anna spent eight years in Highland Park. Some of the time she spent as an urban guidance counselor as well. Along with her many responsibilities, Anna is part of several committees within the school that helps make Irving great. It takes a special person to be a social worker for young children, and Anna is that person. She's compassionate. Anna approaches students in a calm, warm manner. She listens first, then speaks. She offers students comfort when all they feel is chaos. When appropriate, Anna also doesn't mind sprinkling in a little humor to lighten up the mood. She's an expert at gauging what a child needs and providing them with support. Anna is an advocate for her students. She's always communicating with teachers, parents, and administrators in regards to her students and their caseload. Her communication is always done with the child in mind. She offers strategies and tips for how to best support the students, both in the classroom and at home. She's always available for questions, and you may find her on the car line, <laughs> reaching out to many families for signatures and things like that. Anna works well with others, along with the support she gives our students, teachers, and parents. She's also a valuable member of the elementary school child study team. She meets and collaborates with her team. She's always willing to lend a helping hand whenever it's needed. Anna goes above and beyond each day for the families of Highland Park. Her dedication to our students doesn't go unnoticed. She takes on challenges and is a valuable member of our faculty. Congratulations, Anna. You are a superstar.
Uh, and now it's my pleasure, great pleasure, to introduce Mr. Anthony Benjamin, who's the principal of Bartle School. Come on up, Anthony. You know, I actually love these types of things. <sighs> but today was the day. Right, Scott? Correct. Driving to work today, my car was hit by a Mack truck. <laughs> But that's another story. Um, but it was really important because when I called Dr. Taylor, I talk, called everyone else, and then I was speaking to my siblings. They said, so why are you going? And I said, I can't miss today because there are so many, so many, so many things to do today. And then tonight is really, really important and special. Then I got here tonight, and I actually lost my speech for you guys. But see, I'm pretty good at this whole ad lib thing, as some of you might know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work this one. All right, so here we go. And I, I, I thought of Carol, um, both our Teacher of the Year and our Educational Support um, Professional of the Year, and a quote came to mind, and the quote was, when you change, or however you want to go, if, or when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, by Wayne Dyer. Absolute wonderful person. So our Teacher of the Year, I want this individual to come up here, is our very own esteemed fifth grade teacher, Miss Lindsay Fisher. Come on up, Lindsay. So, three words actually come to mind when I think of Lindsay. Positive, optimistic, and solution-oriented. This is Lindsay in a nutshell, seriously. Hey, Mr. B, I have a solution to a problem I think we're gonna be having. That's really her. Every time she comes to me, it's always with a solution to what she believes is a potential problem. And I can say, if we can actually clone that, oh, that would be fabulous. As opposed to, we have a problem, you need to fix it. It's always, I have a solution. So it's always something well thought out. I heard um, um, Principal Freeborn talk about, um, you know, how Ms. Shannon listens and then responds, and I have to say, Equally so with Ms. Fisher. She is so responsive. She listens. She's been a part of our founding um, uh, a group, our EPIC group, which is uh, in encouraging positivity, inspiring change. And we've done phew, countless, countless events. I can't say, I can't even name the number of events that we've actually done this year and last year. And it keeps growing, it keeps growing. Um, Anna's a part of a lot of that. A lot of our teachers, both here at Bartle and in other schools, have been a part of this whole experience to encourage positivity, inspire change. So it's an amazing, a major initiative. Lindsay also sits on our safety um, and culture and climate committee, which is a very, very critical um, uh, committee in our school. And it really helps to ensure that our students are safe and that they have a great and wonderful environment to come to school in. And we're really excited. I see two of our kids here, um, uh, both Jack and Emma in our audience. And I can say to you that it's just wonderful when they have such a wonderful experience. I know Jack just came back from our Bartle, um, uh, our um, Camp Bernie trip, and we had a wonderful time. Miss Fisher was on that trip, and she can attest to the amazing experience that the students had. And many of you in the audience who have students who actually went on that trip, you can see just how wonderful both Miss Kirk and Miss Fisher ensure that this event um, comes to fruition. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, everybody, this person is truly amazing. She's made the job of being a principal. Wow, unbelievably easy, it's blessed. And I know mom was a teacher. Mom, she's the real deal. Couldn't get better. Lindsay is absolutely adored, admired, respected, 
couldn't have it any other way because she is truly the best. So thank you, Ms. Fisher, for all that you do. We have a gift from one of our favorite students. So this next person who absolutely, when, when we put the picture up of teacher of the year and then educational uh, support professional of the year, she says, oh, you picked that picture? <laughs> Carol, come on up. What can I say about Carol? What can I say about you? You're crazy. I won't, I won't ever say that. Okay. Carol is one of our esteemed paraprofessionals who works with our amazing special ed students. And, you know, I don't know why I've been really emotional now lately these days, but I have to say, you know, Carol, Carol told me when, when she first got in, she says, you could be, when I first got in in 2014, 2015, she told me that I could be her son. And, and that was, it was an endearing comment, I have to say, um, because she has been an amazing surrogate, not only to just, you know, her colleagues, myself, but to the students. They absolutely love this young lady right here. <laughs> Cal goes out of her way pretty much for anyone and everyone each and every day. Our main office sometimes can be, Bardo is a pretty large school, so our main office can be a bit chaotic in the morning because if there's not that many subs and this is going in, she's always offering advice to Linda Moran, hey, I, you might want to consider this. And because she knows the school so well, she's dead on with her advice. So it's like, okay, so Cal, what do you think? And so we oftentimes, in the morning, will look to Carol and say, hey, Carol, what do you know about this? And if there's changes that we might need in supports, we always look, for, look to Carol for that support. Carol runs something that's called, we call it, for all of you shopaholics, you call it the Nordstrom Rack. We have what's called a barter rack. So Carol is the orchestrator. She orchestrates and she coordinates what we call our barter rack. She makes sure that all the kids who loses things, it's coordinated and put in a certain spot. She bought hangers and she color coordinates things. And she makes sure that, she ensures that everything, that anything that the kids lose, it's there for them to pick up and find. We can't get enough of the support that you do for us. We really appreciate everything. And oh, I, I, there's just not much I can say to, speak to the volumes of what you do for us. So please, thank you for everything we do, Carol. Okay. Became a grandmother. Yay. Oh, I forgot. Carol became a grandmother. And Lindsay, in September, something special is going to happen. Everybody, please give Lindsay and Carol another round of applause.
So I had the honor of awarding the middle school teacher of the year and support person of the year. And um, that's easy for me because I have had a lot of experience working with Nikki Furingo and Stephanie Miller, both as a parent here in Highland Park, uh, who, had, who had a child who um, got the wonderful experience that one gets coming in and out of Nikki Faringo's uh, class and the support from Mrs. Miller, who now works in both the eighth grade as well as the high school. So first though, I'd like to um, honor Ms. Faringo. So Ms. Faringo, would you come up please? So one of the um, visions that I had when I came here to Highland Park for instruction, for learning, is that uh, kids are always cognitively engaged on a high level. They don't come, they don't sit and just act like passive uh, learners, like um, vases you can just fill up with water or knowledge. They're people who have to engage in their learning, they have to build things, they have to be a part of the world that they're learning about. And that is exactly what um, both my daughter, uh, my daddy had on and has experienced and I have seen as a superintendent in Ms. Faringo's class. Whenever I walk in that classroom, which is almost, I'd say every other day, if not every day, and I walk right in, I walk around, I start talking to the kids, they are always doing, and that's what it's about, they're always doing. They're not just sitting, they're not just waiting, they're constantly doing, and what they're doing has a lot to do with, our, with what our community believes in, and that is social justice, uh, becoming activists, people who care about other people, people who want to do good. So eff effectively has Ms. Faringo instilled that in her students that she was recently recognized by um, a very esteemed organization that honors schools and special programs with awards um, that speak about character education. So Ms. Faringo is a very new recipient of a Best Practice Character Education Award for Be the Change. So I do want to <laughs> applaud her for that. In fact, she'll be, um, she has been invited and she'll be attending a national forum for those select few around the country who were honored in just such a way. So uh, Be the Change has been more than just um, something that's wonderful for the kids. It's actually now a best practice that other people are modeling. We're blessed to have you. You fit in beautifully, not only to the community, but to the sixth grade team. And I, I think I speak for all your teammates when I say that. So, um, but the family would like to come up. We'll do pictures if you'd like. Come on up. I know we have parents here. The next person I would like to honor just got here to Highland Park. We stole her from another school district, which will remain unnamed, um, just because I don't want to make them feel bad. We are blessed to have Stephanie Miller, who I'd like to have come up to the podium, guidance counselor at the middle and high school, and support teacher, support person of the year for the middle school. When we hired Ms. Miller, um, she was smiling just the way she is now. That's actually one of the things that everybody who interacts with her notes. I've never seen you not smile, I swear. <laughs> I'm not just saying that, I'm not exaggerating. Always smiling, even through 95 degree weather and, and all and whatnot. Um, but it's the smile that I think speaks volumes about her personality. We, we tasked her to do something quite challenging. When we brought her on board, um, we said, okay, this is like a new job. We're, we're asking you to do 
um, two things at the same time. Work with our high school students, but also work with eighth grade students who were transitioning into the high school. And you ended up running with it and just running away with it. Um, our students speak the world of Miss Miller's kindness, her nurturing attitude. She sits down with you and she speaks with you. She doesn't speak at our students, she speaks with them. Um, and I credit her for a lot of the work that we have been doing to build um, a new program into uh, the way we're now working with students called Restorative Practices. And I, I know she's gonna be helping the high school um, team to continue that work when our eighth graders move on to ninth grade. So Ms. Miller, congratulations. So we have three more individuals uh, we'd like to honor for their many years of, uh, so actually, no, I'm sorry, I've I skipped Mr. Lasseter before I get to the, uh, to, to the retirees. <laughs> Mr. Lasseter, high school principal, come on up, you're up. So before I talk about the high school uh, teacher of the year and the support professional of the year, I did want to mention just a couple of things regarding Ms. Faringo and Ms. Miller. Ms. Faringo, uh, I just want to give a shout out to you. Um, one of my best uh, situations of hiring a social studies teacher to come into our district, I couldn't be more proud of you and everything that you've done with our middle school in preparing those students to really make a difference and change the world. So congratulations to you. And as Dr. Taylor said, Ms. Miller came on board to help our eighth graders transition into the high school as ninth graders. And so Ms. Miller, thank you so much for helping to make that transition so smooth um, and really impacting both our middle school and our high school, which I know is sometimes a juggling act, but you do it so well. So thank you so much. And now our teacher of the year, Ms. Sarah Grunstein, please come on up here, please. Now she told me before she doesn't does do this so well. She's so humble, uh, but uh, she is a woman that really deserves recognition in our high school. She came in 2005 um, and really changed the way art was being taught in the high school uh, to make it so hands-on. Um, she's really basically taken our sculpture, our ceramics, our printmaking, and now our public art course, which she proposed, to a whole nother level in regards to how it gets our kids to actually value art and be able to feel like artists when they may have never felt that way before. She even put up a website and worked with her colleague, Ms. Fantry, to help showcase all our student work out to the public. So whenever you go on the high school website, click on the art link and you'll see some of that amazing work. But she doesn't just leave it there and it's not small. Sometimes the art really just takes over our entire building. Um, and so if you walk through the high school, we are so fortunate because of the public art course and everything, Ms. Grunstein, we have eight beautiful murals that have been added to the walls of our building and they showcase environmental and cultural heritage themes and our students really are invested in making our building beautiful and being proud of everything they do because of Ms. Grunstein. Um, if you've ever been to Grounds for Sculpture in uh, Hamilton, um, you'll know that John Seward Johnson uh, has these life-size uh, sculptures all around uh, the park. Um, well, Ms. Grunstein actually has our students do the same thing. And you'll walk around the building and every once in a while you'll have to take a second look that see whether it's a student or actually one of the sculptures. Now, she made sure this year uh, and last year uh, that they're no longer full color sculptures, they're, they're white plaster, but the students literally put themselves into the sculptures, laying on the ground and actually encasing themselves so that we have memories of them throughout the building. Um, She's also worked with partnerships with uh, Colabs and the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership. 
to take recycled materials from the Raritan River and actually have the students make these sculptures that have been displayed, I think, uh, over at uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, in the children's wing. Um, next year, she's partnering up with Mason Gross and bringing them in to work directly with our printmaking uh, class. She takes art up to the level where our students feel like they're really going to be taking on a career of this. In fact, some of them have actually worked with her on her, their portfolios for college. Um, and she volunteers of her own time in independent studies to work with them on that. Um, Dr. Taylor talked about Miss Miller's smiles, but Ms. Grunstein's smiles are, are infectious. Um, and she comes into our office daily to help out with things whenever um, she's not working in her class. Um, the last thing that really makes her stand out is just her honesty. Very few people will tell you every single thing and make sure they check with you before they do the slightest. She lives right down the block and could leave the building any time, but she tells me, and even when there's an emergency uh, with the pets or, or, or anything like that, she asks permission to leave before she rushes out of the building to take care of those things. And I really, really, truly value that kind of respect. Um, lastly, I don't know if she knows this, but I was an art student in high school for three years. Um, one year I decided, you know what, I can't do this anymore because the art teacher was just so mean. And I said, no, I, I just don't want to do this. She actually begged me to come back my senior year to do this. But if I'd had Miss Grunstein for four years of high school, I may not be here right now. I actually might out be, be out being an artist and, and not having the stress of this job. So um, I would have loved to have you. You could have definitely saved me all that stress. And uh, she really deserves a round of applause for all she does. So now I'd like to call up our educational support professional, Ms. Kristen Alpar, our guidance counselor in the high school. We've been talking a lot about smiles, and I, I, I guess I, I feel great about that because so many people come to work smiling. But Ms. Alpal is another one that has that smile that's just infectious um, and, and really helps to share the positivity that we need in a guidance counselor, particularly in the high school. She was hired in October of 2013, and next year in October will be her tenure year, and we look forward to giving her that because she's worked so hard and definitely deserves uh, the tenure of being a, a permanent member of our faculty. So give her a round of applause for that. And that's not easy to do when you were hired as the lead counselor with very little experience and took on the high school test coordinator position, head of our IRNS, which is the Intervention and Referral Services, the 504 committee, the AP coordinator, and making sure that at the same time you're juggling all those responsibilities, you help our students to be career and college ready. It was an amazing juggling act. And now let's add some more balls to that plate. When we talk about test coordinator for the high school, you talk about, of course, uh, used to be the HSPT, but now is the park. Um, the ACCUPLACER is another test that our students have a chance to take for graduation. The SAT, the ACT, the AP tests. And if you don't do well on any of those, maybe we even try to give you the ASVAB as well. Now imagine coordinating all that and again, Ms. Alpaw is able to do that and dedicate herself to providing that positive support for all our students that are in her caseload. She has that open door in her office. And in fact, she has a little mirror in the corner so she can see who's coming, and just so she can be ready to deal with anyone that walks through that door um, to provide that supportive, nurturing environment that we need in our guidance counselors. Um, and they're greeted with that beautiful smile. 
she's a team collaborator, as Ms. Miller, I'm sure, will attest. Um, we need a team in guidance, and the, the three guidance counselors work together, really, to meet the needs of all the students. Uh, Ms. Oppo was nominated by her peers um, because they really see her as an integral part in our school. The whole committee, when we met and discussed um, who should be the Educational Support Professional of the Year, really have seen you step up to all these challenges, take them with grace, take them with style, um, and you've risen to all those challenges, always making sure to make, meet the needs of our students first. So I thank you from the bottom of our heart. So now, about those three individuals who we're honoring for their many years of service, I'd like to bring Ms. Freeborn back because she's going to speak about one special support person right now. Ms. Staples, come on up. She doesn't like to have a fuss made of her, so this is a big deal. So we have to make one fuss. Okay. Just a little bit, okay? And then, and then we'll move on, I promise. It's my pleasure to speak on behalf of Eleanor Staples. Ms. Staples has been a paraprofessional in Highland Park for 39 years. It's pretty good stuff, right? Any teacher that worked with her was lucky to benefit from her excellent organizational skills. She's extremely efficient. She's handled most of the paperwork so the teacher didn't need to take time doing clerical tasks and could focus more on preparing lessons for the students. Eleanor was able to develop close relationships with her classroom teachers. They always felt valued by her and she always spoke very highly of them. Word on the street is that once you worked with Eleanor, you had a loyal friend for life. There's nothing she wouldn't do for you after that. She would sing your praises to anyone and would listen and make sure all was well in your classroom and it ran like a machine. Some little facts that you may not know about Eleanor. Eleanor is a talented artist. She contributed a great deal to the school through her artwork. She enjoys gardening and Avon products. <laughs> I think her daughter sells them. Um, Eleanor is a loyal customer in the cafeteria where she bought her lunch each day. Uh, she also had a, she had a very short commute to school as well, right around the corner. Um, Eleanor is a proud grandmother and great-grandmother. She loves to share stories of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren and their photos and tell about what's going on in their lives. Eleanor has dedicated 39 years to Highland Park. We are proud that she's been an Irving Dragon. Eleanor, enjoy your much-deserved retirement. We will miss you at Irving, but know that you're in good hands with your family. Please join me in congratulating Eleanor on her retirement. Before we take pictures, With great honor and recognition for your loyal and dedicated service. Something for the home. And in this bag is a whole lot of, or a whole lot of goodies, which you're going to open up later. Um, and I mean it. We really we went over the top on this one. So <laughs> hold on to that. And at this time, we'd love to take some photos. So if Eleanor's family is here, come on up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And now I'd like to reintroduce Mr. Lassiter, who's going to speak about two individuals in his building. Mr. Lassiter. So I get to speak on behalf of uh, Ms. Bodine, who could not be here tonight, in the Educational Service Department about two retirees uh, from our high school building. Um, the first retiree, uh, Ms. Marianne Feinberg, is more of a district employee, but was in our high school, and I really loved having her uh, right next door. So come on up, Marianne. She has to stay up here while we talk about her. Uh, Marianne started her journey with Highland Park as her two daughters entered our preschool and then watched as they graduated from our high school, not before getting through my class. Um, and they were both wonderful, wonderful students. She then began her career as a paraprofessional and then later as a secretary with the Highland Park School District and has stayed for, with us for 23 wonderful years. She served the Educational Service Department and all of the staff, students, and administrators who came her way. Marion was known for her warm smile, quick wit, large heart, and amazing dance moves, which I never got a chance to see. When Marianne was present, the environment could not help but be positive and upbeat. Her special way of working with people, staff, students, and parents made them feel comfortable and supported. She was a wonderful asset to the district. She was conscientious, organized, and thorough in all she did. And one of the things that I remember most about is, is coordinating home instruction for students who were ill or had some crisis in their life. Um, and I always knew that I could count on Marianne to make sure that that student got exactly what they needed uh, in very difficult times. Um, and she did that so wonderfully. Having her part of the department uh, for special ed made us stronger and more efficient in so many ways. We wish Marianne the very best as she moves on to the next phase in her life, and we'll miss her very much as she enjoys Cape May. Next up, I'd like to uh, welcome up Ms. Janet Cluxon, who is retiring from our special ed department as well. Come on over here as we speak about you as well. Janet was a learning disability consultant with the Highland Park High School District for nine years after working in this role for many years prior uh, to coming with us. She joined our child study team and immediately became part of the family. She served students at the middle and high school levels as her case manager and supported many teachers and parents working with his students as well. She always created a safe and positive environment for her students and helped them to grow and succeed while in school. And I remember, uh, Janet, really, there, there are so many difficult cases and dealing with learning disabilities and understanding the different strategies that are needed to actually address those needs, not an easy task, uh, but you did it so sophisticatedly and were able to really give those teachers the skills they needed to meet the needs of our students and, and we really miss that. She is greatly missed by her students, their families, the staff, and the district as a whole. We wish her the very best as she moves on to another wonderful phase in her life and enjoys time at home uh, with her husband. Oh, oh, and she's in Cape May also, so Marianne and her can uh, have those dance parties together.
So um, before I point out that everyone who wishes to leave can leave now, <laughs> I would like the Schlesinger family to stay behind so we can get one more picture with our board president. So before you go, come on up to the podium. But this would be the right time if you'd like to diplomatically slip out to slip out. <laughs> I appreciate you all coming out. Congratulations to everybody. I'm going to get started and uh, talk about the state of the district. So those of you who would like to stick around for that are welcome to. Mr. Presti, you're so far away. Okay. Storing the ice Yes. Watch for that bump. It always gets everybody. So um, at about this time of the year, I like to wrap up by giving a state of the district address to the um, community and the board. This year, however, I've divided it into two parts because as opposed to last year, we now have a full year of the strategic plan under our belt. I'm not going to go over every detail about the plan, but I am going to give you a very broad overview of what we closed out this past year and what's coming up next year. The first thing I'd like to do, though, which I didn't do last year either, is recognize um, the district for its accolades and awards it received. So uh, I'll start by um, pointing out, this might be new news to some, that the district was recognized as a district of distinction for the work it did to uh, promote gender inclusivity and um, specifically uh, what was then called its transgender policy. Bottom line, we're, um, we're being recognized for all the work we've done to um, promote equity um, in all areas. We all have received every school certification at the bronze level as Sustainable Jersey for Schools this year. Uh, Tracy Maiden is the district coordinator. Melody McDermott is a uh, resident who, um, and parent who uh, helped to a liaison us with Rutgers University and, um, and the Sustainable Jersey for Schools organization. Irving School received gold level status for being a uh, safe route to school recipient. That means that um, it has worked hard to promote um, walking to school, biking to school. Uh, hasn't necessarily, um, we haven't necessarily seen a drop off in the um, car drop offs in the morning, but at least we know we have that many more kids walking and biking to school. Our high school, as Mr. Lasseter pointed out a couple of meetings ago, received honor roll status for uh, the work it has done in uh, providing more access to the AP exam and for the high level of scores our students have received. And um, whether you believe in the ranking system or not, uh, and it's, it's hard to believe in some of them because the criteria is all over the map, perception does count for something. And we were recognized by U.S. News and World Report, our high school was, as being number 36 in the state. We were given a silver award. Speaking of recognitions, one that is gaining more popularity is uh, the Niche ranking. Niche.com is a website, an organization that started up a couple of years ago and is gaining a popularity because it claims to use a lot of different metrics to assess a district quality, including um, Re resident reviews, resident feedback. We received an A-plus rating uh, for the past year. As I pointed out, our middle school um, sixth grade program, Be the Change, was recognized for being uh, a national promising practice by the character.org group. Our middle school students received a, a silver award for um, competing and also uh, competing effectively and also promoting community service here in town over the last year. The Jefferson Award is a uh, nationally recognized award for middle and high school students um, to, to help promote activism and social justice. And finally, as we've mentioned fre frequently, recently our high school track team, girls track team, took the championship. So those are the things that we've um, been recognized for. A reminder to all, we carry on with our strategic plan. Those who have not had an opportunity to check the progress of our plan can go to the website and see that we've color-coded progress, blue indicating the action steps that have been fully implemented, yellow um, pointing out that these are developing action steps that are still in progress, and those that are shaded in red are action steps that we either have not begun or we will not continue into next year. 
the decisions to either continue an action step or not have been made by committees at the committee levels. And those committees are made up of parents, administrators, teachers, and uh, in a few cases, residents who don't have children in the school district. So just speaking very broadly about the work we've done so far, what's ahead next year? We are doing a lot of work in the area of supporting the Whole Child Initiative, which is covered by the first focus area of our strategic plan. And um, if you look at it big picture, Wise, you'll see that uh, the responsive classroom model is what we've incorporated to promote social emotional wellness at the K-5 level. And the natural progression is going to be the restorative conferences and reactive conferences at the middle and high school. So students are going to be building relationships in circles, um, talking to each other, with each other, with teachers present, K to 12. It'll just look a little different depending on the grade level. We have trained uh, a core group of teachers and support personnel to turnkey responsive classroom, I'm sorry, re um, restorative practice strategies to their peers. That'll happen in September. We've also conducted a homework study because um, part and parcel to the whole child initiative is the recognition that um, kids are stressed out these days. They've got a lot going on after school. Um, expectations have um, risen. Um, societally. So we undertook a homework study that included a, uh, a survey to which 400 people responded, teachers, parents, students, high school students, administrators. I then conducted uh, focus groups. I have two left. I'll be conducting six focus groups. I've already met with uh, high school students, Bartle students, a group of parents, teachers, Tomorrow night, I'll meet with a second group of parents who couldn't make it for the last session, last Sunday. Um, and I'll be meeting with the middle school kids uh, later in the week. Our K-5 team is um, rebuilding the health curriculum, but it's not just incorporating family life and sex education in the K-5 program, which was absent for many years. It's also taking a better look at how we can uh, build the policy that we have um, built around gender inclusivity into the curriculum. Just uh, last Friday, the um, Bartle team that's writing the health curriculum engaged in a uh, Skype workshop with a group called Gender Spectrum based out in San Francisco. Um, and we were, we were wowed. Um, the speaker focused on gender inclusivity, how to help kids understand that gender is not just one thing or the other, how to help people recognize that um, um, gender identity is dependent upon that person's association with a particular gender or not. We were so impressed with the work we did with um, uh, Gender Spectrum that we are seriously contemplating having the same Skype workshop for all of our staff sometime after school in the fall. And we looked at later uh, start times at the high school. We researched what practices were out there. There was really no question that later start times are important to um, promote the whole child, but uh, it was a matter of the model we used and the model we devised has led to, we think, um, up to two thirds of our students coming in an hour later um, during this school year next year. Now, obviously, those of you who've been briefed on the high school schedule know that the the music program has been built into the zero period, that's the first period of the day, that students can bypass if they want to come in later so they can take their core subjects. Obviously, I'm going to have to keep a very watchful eye over how this may potentially negatively impact band, chorus, and classical music program. So I'll be keeping a close eye on, on uh, whether we see a drop off in enrollment because students felt that they would be um, better off coming into school late, even if it meant dropping out of one of those musical ensembles. So I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on that. This past year, we incorporated professional development in all these areas, and we'll be continuing to build on professional development, especially when it comes to the PAR. Uh, we were uh, negligent in um, effectively screening students for potential dyslexia and then intervening. Uh, this year, we we started on a path of making that right, but we still have a long way to go. So next year, we're going to incorporate a second round of, of uh, training for our Irving staff, specifically in how to interpret data that they get out of the 
um, not just the PAR, but also the portfolio that they're keeping on a student, which includes the PAR, but also how to incorporate the proper interventions outside of the student going to a special interventionist, uh, who in the case of Irving is uh, Miss Nicole Yuan. Co-teaching is something we are going to be launching next year. Um, we're going to do it slowly and gradually. Our director of special services is gonna be responsible for doing that. We are confident that we have some teachers um, incorporating the model we think is the best practice, but we wanna make sure it's consistent in all schools. So that's why we're going to reset, essentially, start from step one uh, and work with all of our teachers in that area. All of our teachers are going to be getting this calendar, actually they received it already, they received this calendar tonight of all of the professional learning community dates. Now what we're doing differently next year is we are putting all of our eggs in a few baskets as opposed to what we've done in the past. In the past, our PLCs, those are the after school meetings we have with teachers on Mondays um, in which we would do either a workshop or we would have a meeting. Sometimes we would substitute uh, PLCs with faculty meetings. This next year, 2017-18, we're gonna dedicate all 13 after school PLCs to one topic, and that's cultural responsiveness. Teachers will be broken into small groups by school. They'll be giving you a menu of options, of research options. Some can engage in action research, which would have them um, researching a best practice regarding cultural responsiveness, incorporating it in the classroom, and then assessing um, its effectiveness over the course of the year. Some can engage in book studies, some can engage in professional studies with periodical articles, but everybody, K-12, is going to um, rally around that one topic, which is prevalent in a lot of the first focus area of our strategic plan. The other thing that's going to happen is five hours are going to be dedicated in every school for dialogue between teachers and, in some cases, between students and teachers about student-teacher relationships which is a necessary ingredient if in the whole cultural responsive initiative. Five hours, all of our teachers either talking to each other about student-teacher relationships or the upper grades in particular, sitting down with students so we can have some honest and open dialogue in a safe environment um, with each other. The last thing I want to touch on has to do with curriculum. It falls under the second focus area. It actually falls into focus areas two, three, and four, but a lot of it shows up in action steps in the second focus area. Just a reminder, we have a five-year curriculum revision cycle that Dr. Nakoja and Ms. Ackley are um, wedded to, and they have implemented it with fidelity. What I'm most proud of is the work that they've done right here, and that is to make sure that when teachers are hired to do the curriculum writing, and that will start up this summer in various areas, depending on where they fall in the revision cycle, that they receive proper professional development, which is one of the early steps, early phases of the second step. And then they're coached and guided by supervisors instead of being sent off on their own and writing curriculum in isolation. The professional development is gonna be conducted by Dr. Nicosia who happened to have worked very closely with a gentleman by the name of Grant Wiggins. Uh, he's since passed away about a year ago. Grant Wiggins is one of the two fathers of a, a very popular and effective design, curriculum design model called Understanding by Design. Some refer to it as backwards design. Uh, and Dr. Nikoji is going to be teaching our teachers about that protocol and then uh, sitting down with them and Ms. Uh, Ackley to be sure that they follow the rest of the steps. Are there any questions at this time? I can shut down the projector if you want to return to your seats. Next meeting in July, actually not next meeting, but in July, the second part of the State of the District is going to focus on the New Jersey Department of Education performance reports, which are mostly based on the standardized test data that they collect, also based on chronic absenteeism rates, um, staff, uh, staff attendance, and uh, some other metrics. Um, did, could we get questions? Yes. Yeah. Could we get a copy of that um, form that was presented under professional development? Is that I? The calendar. I, I think it might have been a calendar. I, I couldn't tell. It was like yeah. a. Yeah. 
Are you talking about the calendar the or the revision cycle? The PLC. The, the PLC calendar? I can send I that, that if you'd it, like. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't tell the, the font was so small, but um, I, I was just curious about the, the professional development detail. We, we, in the past, we hadn't told staff ahead of time what all the PLCs were going to be about, but today I actually spoke to all of the teachers after school, except middle school, I'll be speaking with them tomorrow, <laughs> presented it with that calendar. And um, it was emphatic about the need for us to focus on that one area. We need to do things all in, or I don't think we should be doing them yet or at all. And I think we have to be all in when it comes to cultural responsiveness. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Madam President, all back right. to you. All right, so we will move on to our committee reports. Um, first is curriculum and instruction. Michelle. Okay. Get comfortable, guys. <laughs> Get cozy. It's going to be a long one. Okay, so our meeting, uh, we met on Monday, the 5th of June. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we, we had to meet a little bit late because um, I was late to the meeting. It was a jam-packed meeting, so... We covered a lot. We um, had a visit from Ms. Ax Ackley. Um, she was there to give us the humanities update. And we began by discussing dyslexia screening and intervention. Um, the teacher training for dyslexia screening and uh, specifically the PAR assessment was delayed, unfortunately, because the PAR materials did not arrive until the day of the training in October. Um, they did, you know, have a training, it was two hours, and it was focused on um, administration and assessment. Um, additional training was, giving about, was given about how to use the data, which is currently something that the teachers feel they need some additional assistance with. Um, <clears throat> so the teachers have been reaching out with questions, and Ms. Ackley has been um, working with those teachers who have reached out, and it, you know, she had said that it was a productive meetings every time that she had gotten together with teachers to discuss um, any questions. and. Um, this September, they're going to be uh, doing some more uh, group training with Ms. Ackley, but right now they're currently doing one-on-one -on -one to understand the, prog the program's coding system. Um, so they, you know, for instance, will have a letter signif signifying, you know, a, a broader concept. And so reading the assessment data is a little bit of a challenge. So trying to decode, funny enough, the dyslexia screening coding, haha. Uh, -ha was something that they, they um, had to go through, and they continue to go through it. So um, it's a brand new assessment, and um, you know it seems like everyone's happy to have it. Um, the assessment includes phonemic awareness, letter identification, picture naming, and rapid response. Um, the assessments are quick and easy to administer for the teachers one-on-one <clears throat> -on -one with students. So they will pull a student out to a smaller table in the classroom, from what I understand, do the assessment quickly, and then have them return to, to instruction. So they're not pulled out for long periods of time. They're not missing a lot of classwork, unlike other assessments that you know the children have to take. Um, parent reports are presented or provided um, with the PAR assessment, and um, they give parents at-home strategies to work with their children, which um, is important because uh, the specific skills that they're learning in um, in school to decode and, and to manage otherwise um, should be reinforced. So this helps parents understand their child's strengths and difficulties in helpful ways. It's available in multiple languages for families that are not native English speakers, which is um, important in, in our district for sure. The PAR uh, assessment is administered in the early fall and again in the spring, and this helps to track progress. Baseline data is not available for previous years to clearly understand if dyslexia has become a greater or a lesser issue in our district. So the PAR assessment this year will provide us with a baseline so we can track changes in student population's need. Tremendous progress has been documented in reading skill generally um, <clears throat> in our district now that some of these interventions have been put in place. And um, one of those interventions is the qualitative reading inventory, which gives us an assessment tool to discover background knowledge on a topic. That, wait, hold, that's not an intervention. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah just a, it's it was, an assessment tool. Okay. So <coughs> the interventions that grow out of these assessments, yeah. that's what I should have said. Um, so the QRI um, de uh, shows delays um, 
when students are giving a reading sample on a topic, they can't answer questions about the topic sufficiently, although they might be expert at that topic. So they're you know, concentrating on reading comprehensions. Um, interventionists will be given train training on June 15th, in just a few days, on how to administer the QRI. Um, more expertise will help inform INRS cases so that we can understand if the student is dealing with dyslexia or a comprehension issue. So this will include information for middle school teachers to help find time for writing intervention because their schedule is different from Bartles and, and Irving's. Um, so Ms. Ackley told us that, you know, for example, A day and B day in the middle school, they will be designated as writing days or reading days. So it will make it easier for the students as well to know um, what's happening, what's coming up. Um, the Words Their Way pilot, a reading program, uh, was a success at Bartle from all indicators next year. <coughs> excuse me, all second and fourth grade classrooms will be expected to include word study instruction. Fifth grade teachers can provide small group instruction to students in need. Um, English lear learners, um, below grade level readers, etc. Several students in the third grade class were reading at a kindergarten level at the beginning of this year, and so. Um, According to Ms. Ackley, we can now show that all third grade uh, students in these classrooms uh, using the Words Their Way pilot program are reading at a third grade level or above. Um, and some have achieved a lot more. Um, she said that 14 students in the third grade are now working at a fourth grade level. I think that's, I don't think it's reading levels. I think that it's their, the ability to uh, recognize those words and the vocabulary lists are you know leveled by grade okay and I don't I think it's reading level. she had actually said that she said reading level yeah she had said that we had had readers who were starting at this letter grade reading level and then they had jumped to you know for instance if it was a C reader they had jumped to an H reader okay so okay. maybe okay. we need no, to clarify because yeah, that's what I, the words their way isn't isn't is not the font and Pinal no no, so that's I got that's yeah. yeah. So maybe there is some confusion, but that's what I had understood from her examples. Okay, which is why I interpreted it this way. But maybe we should clarify with, yeah. with her. Words their way will not identify reading level. Fontes and Pinnell will. Okay. So that's what Miss Ackley should have shared with you at the curriculum meeting. Yeah, I understood that she had used Fontes and Pinnell to give us that data. So I was confused about that. So what what was she talking about when she gave us the examples of? you know, C readers had jumped to an H level. So I think that's, that is Fontes and Pinnell. Yeah. Right. So she must have been saying the kids who were getting this intervention, like that's then how they're gauging the... So that would be reading. Correct. That's how they're, yeah, so that's how they're gauging the... Okay. That's well, I God. recorded the, the meeting at, because it's the end of a work day, right? And I did play that part back several times because it was confusing. So... I am going to have Ms. Ackley come back to a meeting in August so okay. she could provide an update, both Ms. Ackley and Dr. Nikosia, so she could focus on that if you'd like. Okay. I mean, I did send her these notes as well, and I didn't get any commentary on that part, so I ran with it. <laughs> Is that proper, though, to say that the third graders are yes. now reading it? Okay. So, um, yeah, from what I had understood, Ruth, that was a reading level, not vocabulary. Yeah, no, I could. Way it's not vocabulary. That is for sure. It is reading level, but again, PAR is not to determine it for that. No, this was a Words Their Way pilot. So the vocabulary had, you know, uh, informed their reading so that their Fontes and Pinnell score had jumped to several levels above. And, and I would just say from my own personal experience with the, the Fontes and Pinnell stuff, what, the level that a kid tests on Fontes and Pinnell, which is a relatively short assessment, like mm -hmm. there's not a lot of depth going on there. What a kid shows in terms of a grade level on Fontes and Pinnell and what their actual functional level is, I've found there can be dramatic, okay, a, a, a wide gap in between Fontes and Pinnell says your kid is on grade level, but then my your your the kid is given grade level material and can't handle grade level material. Okay. So, but, you know, I, think I, that's I, I take she was I, bringing in the QRI. To yeah, help with right. That. I take anything like that with a with a, a great big old grain of salt because okay. it, at the end of the day it's how well is that kid performing right. in the classroom setting as opposed to a you know a letter grade or a you know whatever yeah I think that's why like Ruth had said the QRI was something that was being supplementary to Fontes and Pinnell and <coughs> other assessments that were giving right I mean I think it, but I don't know that how good it is I'm not speaking we're, we're, to its oh, quality no, 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 no absolutely absolutely yeah I mean I mean I, I think it would help to also get that information fortified with, you know, 
classroom data from from the teacher. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, there were a couple of things that we had talked about. I think that we had asked for data on several different topics. That might have been one of them, but we had not received any feedback. We asked for data from the there were several the things intervention there, program. There, what is it called? Ramp. 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 Yeah, that was one of them. Yeah, so maybe there's just a delay and we can have that information before the 19th meeting. But I know for sure that we had asked for a couple different things that were not handed to us. And it's busy time of year, so I'm sure there's a good reason. Um, okay, so uh, last thing on words their way. Um, the teachers seemed excited to bring this program uh, back to Highland Park, meaning that for next year, it will no longer be a pilot. It will be for all second, third, and fourth graders. Um, and the fifth graders will only be using this program in small group instruction on a needs basis. Um, so basically, this, that's going to be the phonics program yeah. that we're using in, in the district. Um, sort of, kind of, in a way. <laughs> Phonics is part of it. It's the it's where they. I don't know if our kids ever had it. I'm not sure where they cut out words. Yeah, yeah. That, and then they do all different word sorts with right. them. So sometimes the word sorts are you know phonics based. Sometimes it's just recognition right. of vocabulary patterns, things like that. Right. Right. She had shown us those binders that she mm -hmm. provided the teachers. Yeah. Um. So, where did I leave off here? Um, okay. Readers and writers workshop. Readers and writers workshop. Here we go. Grades K, K through five. Um, readers workshop will officially begin with Lucy Calkins unit of study in September at Irving and Bartle. Um, curriculum crosswalk um, has been completed for kindergarten through five. Alignment will be complete moving forward now that the curriculum crosswalk is complete. A range of genres will be available to students rather than informational texts only. Training will be complete in three years for all kindergarten through fifth teachers in readers and writers workshop. Um, we had a discussion uh, about some concerns that um, Ruth had uh, had about readers and writers workshop. Um, admittedly, I Sorry. did not understand that we were doing readers and writers workshop for <laughs> kindergarten and first grade. I had understood it to be a, a two through five oh, program. Crazy. So um, Ruth had brought up this concern. Uh, I believe that you were concerned about the... What's the question, Michelle? Well, no, we were just, she's just talking about the discussion we had about Lisa Delpit. And, yeah. Um, about what? The, Lisa, Lisa Delpit, Delpit is a, is a um, an African-American educator yes. um, who has written extensively on writer's workshop and its relevance to um, to kids who are growing up in an urban mm -hmm. setting from different cultures. Well, she talked specifically about, I did some research that later that night about unstructured environments, learning environments being potentially detrimental to students who are not. Unstructured curriculum, I think she, not necessarily unstructured learning environments, but the way that the curriculum is presented. So like, you know, in terms of like diagramming sentences. So, you know, there are certain kids who don't need to do diagramming sentences. Like they need the whole language sort of, you know, let it, you know, um, let your writing just flow from your ideas. Where there are kids who actually need to learn grammatical structure, right. step by step by step and that the kids who need that are not getting it necessarily through writer's workshop, that program. So I just wanted Mrs. Ackley, Miss, Miss Ackley, to you know, think about that and look into it so that, because we're, we're talking all about cultural you know, responsiveness and we're really focusing on that for the coming year, that that's you know, something to, to think about in terms of writer's workshop specifically and our kids. If I could make an anecdotal observation, this is not so much about the cultural responsiveness, but I mean, I have certainly found that my kids have not learned grammar, in maybe, <coughs> excuse me, in the way that I did. You know, they know a little bit about a verb and a subject, but they're a little iffy on it, you know, by fifth and sixth grade, fourth and sixth grade. I mean, I wonder if there's a cultural responsiveness issue and there's also an issue about, like, grammar leaving the classroom. I, and this is not new this year, obviously. We've been doing, some of the classes have been doing writer's workshop for a while. 
I mean, is that an issue for all of our children, or I, I don't know. I, I know just, the diagram, diagramming of sentences has been kind of phased out. Yeah, that's old school. Along I with love it though. handwriting, you know, <laughs> uh, cursive handwriting. So I don't know if it's a you know greater change than just in Highland Park. I think it is a greater okay. you know greater world change. But I don't mean to get us off track with that. I just I, I miss grammar. My kids don't know grammar. Right. Yeah, no, I've had, I've had the question asked to me, what's an adjective, you know? And they can't figure out how to, like, why, trying to explain to them why a sentence is ungrammatical is very difficult when they don't have that vocabulary, you know? So I, I hate to see us sort of moving into a program that right. just totally dispenses with that. I'm I mean, I mean she, she, <coughs> she makes, you know, she makes some interesting points, and <coughs> it's perspective, and I just wanted to take that perspective into account as where... So that was what my, my bullet point was. It was yeah. just to highlight the fact that there was a concern that was raised and that um, Dr. Taylor said that, you know, research would be done on his end and that uh, Ms. Ackley mentioned that she had worked in a school where there were 40% of um, ELL students. Uh, of total students, it was 40% ELL. And she assured us that, you know, the difficulties with writer's workshop what were on her radar as far as English language learners. So how does how do you um, sort of build those responses to those concerns into the program, Scott? Like, what do, what do you do in response to these concerns? What I've, is asked, it? I've asked Ms. Ackley to email Dr. Daniels, even though she's not working with us any longer, because she knows our school. I actually did that soon after that Good meeting idea. to get her take on things. Great. So I'll let you know what the response is. Great, thanks. Thank That's you. great. So, um, nice segue here. Cultural relevancy in the ELA program was brought up. Um, cultural res culturally responsive texts are being added to the middle school and high school ELA curricula. These texts meet the 14-point checklist provided by Dr. Robin Daniels after her walkthrough visit of our schools. She suggested that we reorganize our in-class libraries and also the book room. And I went through this part in the recording several times. The book room in the middle school. Did she mean the library in the middle mm -hmm. school? There's a book room? OK. I was not aware of a book room. So I kept going back thinking. There's a book room? Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> where they store their books. Each, each so school has a leveled library. Yeah, yeah. We call it a book like, room. OK. I, I had figured it was a storage facility of some kind for the teacher's <laughs> resource. It was not a book room. A room full of books uh, that yeah. we would go in and use. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, you know, a library, right? So um, in-class <laughs> libraries. That's a new term for library. <laughs> we don't call it library anymore. Uh, right? Book okay. room. <laughs> no, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that I was reporting this properly. So um, not the library, but the in-class libraries, as well as the book room storage <laughs> facility. So um, what she had suggested was that we organize according to genre and include clear labeling on each genre. And I just have to say that I found that to be interesting, that that was not the case already. That seemed to me to be kind of an odd thing to highlight because I had figured that that was what had happened. So As if we had a big book pile or something? I don't know Until now, there before. That doesn't seem it accurate. It was just a holding place. We put books on a shelf. We never so, organized them. But okay. They were by maybe title. Now, I just want to say, the reason that I thought that this was common practice already is that every single classroom that I've been in as a parent has an in-class library. I'm sorry, speaking in the middle school. Has an in-class library that is organized yes. by genre and clearly labeled. So I was confused about what Dr. Daniels had seen. Regardless, we're moving in the right direction. You haven't seen the book room. The book room <laughs> must be a mess. <laughs> so happy to hear that. Um, is that a tour? I want a tour of the book room. On a tour, no. I don't want to see the book Next room. Next time, no, that sounds, that sounds like a little mess. scary. No. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, she was, uh, Dr. Daniels was, um, I, I reported unhappy, that was my interpretation, but there was some sort of remediation that needed to be done about teachers in the middle school having student grades and other personal data displayed publicly. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been here before, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, I had understood that that was a practice that had gone the way of the dinosaurs four and years ago. Assistant superintendent, uh, whatever mm -hmm. her name was. Right. right. So the previous administrator had told them to do so, which is what uh, Ms. Ackley had reported to us. Dr. Daniels, you know, apparently pulled the reins on this and said no. And the middle school PLCs um, were met with to remediate the issue. So I hope that's the last we hear about any personal data or grades being displayed for any student in this district. I was pretty upset about hearing that. And like I said, it was a long day after work. I didn't have time to 
react in the meeting. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is remediated as far as we know as of right now. Great. New books will also be added to our middle school libraries that are culturally diverse. Speaking of grammar, that's awful. So new culturally diverse books will be added to our <laughs> middle school libraries, period. She wants teachers, this is Dr. Daniels again, she wants teachers to have more resources about, the, this is an educational term of essential questions. So an essential question, I added a link in our, our curriculum committee notes here, but um, the example is, what is justice? So an essential question is really a question that has, you know, uh, a plethora of interpretations, is not something that is easily answered. Um, there's no finite definition. Um, so this is something that Dr. Daniels believes that we need to provide to our teachers. Um, and I know that that must be informing our um, culturally responsive you know, circles, our restorative justice program, um, these types of discussions, including essential questions. Uh, moving on, we have the uh, Rutgers dual credit program proposal. The high school teachers, this is um, from what I understand, the uh, language arts teachers in the, in the high school, and Ms. Ackley, we didn't get names, so I'm just assuming this, <laughs> this was the group. And Ms. Ackley attended the New Jersey Writing Alliance Conference two weeks ago at Rutgers where they met the expository writing director. Um, he is interested in meeting to organize this dual credit program with um, Highland Park High School. Um, the high school students would be able to be exempt from taking the 101 course at Rutgers, which is, from what I understand, the expository writing course, um, if they're a part of this dual credit program. So this would be similar to the AP style course, but it would not be universally transferable. Okay. It's not through the AP um, uh, board. Um, students who attend other colleges or universities would obviously possess a greater ability to excel in their expository writing courses after uh, taking this dual credit course. Um, next up is the middle school schedule change review. Um, so the schedule change review is um, going to be using data from the park and other data to um, analyze progress with specific evidence statements and impact of creative writing courses and new middle school schedules on student progress. Ms. Osamwaji will be um, surveying middle school staff about their assessment of the new schedule. Um, Ruth in the meeting suggested that we also include the MAP data in our assessment process and Dr. Taylor seemed to agree that we should include MAP, especially since it's administered three times a year rather than the once a year that PARC is administered and it's a quicker turnaround time for data to be reported, like much quicker. Um, PARC data from last year provided that there are deficiencies in several areas around reading comprehension and writing. Dr. Ackley is seeing trends that will allow her to target writing techniques and analysis skills that are not being taught sufficiently. So just to you know, be clear, the assessment is to be done for the benefit of the middle school staff and you know, to inform future classes uh, going through the middle school. Um, even though they're using the park data and the map data, um, this is to be used at the middle school. They're not going to be you know, graduating this, uh, I'm assuming they're not going to be graduating this um, assessment of the middle school schedule into the high school schedule is completely different. So um, Rob Roslevich suggested that we uh, look at the efficacy of the schedule in terms of all of our original goals because the original goals were diverse. So um, he suggested that it wasn't just how the new schedule affects students' test scores, but how it affects the abilities to fill in the gaps in their schedule, provide students with effective time to study music, um, within the regular school day, etc. There were several different goals that we had discussed when we first adopted the new schedule. Um, item number two was the agenda review. Uh, then we talked about the HIB reporting um, and how it will be reported in the future moving forward. So we will see on our um, agendas rather than a complete HIB report to be, you know, yay or nay, it will be. Um, according to incident. So each incident will have its own unique number um, and student ID will not be um, a part of it. It won't be easily identify like identifiable information, but each incident will have its own number. Um, and that will allow us to have a lot of different <laughs> uh, 
benefits to um, the way that we review the HIP process. Um, agenda item number five is the intervention training Ms. Ackley spoke about in her report uh, concerning the QRI that will occur on June 15th. Item number seven is for Genesis training. And for anyone that doesn't know, the Genesis will take the place of Power School. Uh, the Genesis is a program that is New Jersey based. Right, Power School? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, no, no. Are you, when you're saying agenda, are you? Are you on the agenda now? On the agenda review, yeah. So I'm doing the agenda review and I said items number whatever. That's six. That's, I don't know that it's matching up though to what, oh, okay. Six. Six. Sorry. Six. Sorry. Yeah, number six. I got Sorry. confused. Did that change since our meeting? No. Yeah. Okay, so I just got the wrong number. The agenda. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, scratch that. Number five is graduate students teaching internships, junior practicum. Completely different. This is number six run. Right. Genesis training. Right. So uh, Genesis training will be, you know, the following staff will have that training and then they will turn key their training um, to other staff. And Genesis will, like I said, take the place of power school and it will um, be an improved process, you know, we all believe. Um, it's a New Jersey based program. It is not a, you know, a Pearson product. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, teachers will learn how to set up their online grade books, take attendance, do SGOs, evaluate student data, and complete uh, professional development plans, all in this one area. Uh, item number three on the curriculum, now I'm freaking here, like number three, resolution to approve the following teen center summer program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, when I say item number three here, I'm talking about item number three on our committee meeting, not item number three on the agenda. Okay, so the curriculum development process um, is the next item. Curriculum will be researched, designed, implemented, monitored, and evaluated in a cyclical schedule over the next five years, meaning from this school year, 2016, 2017, to 2021. Um, this plan will help institutionalize a revision process that we can keep indefinitely into the future. Hopefully this will help us prevent curriculum becoming stagnant and fractured year to year for students as it has unfortunately become over the last 10 years or so um, in terms of continuity especially. June 21st, teachers will participate in a workshop that will culminate in a discussion of how assessment drives instruction across all subject areas. Um, Rob noticed some gaps during our meeting and redundancies in the revision cycle that Dr. Taylor said that he will look into, remediate, et cetera. Um, but you know, he had mentioned that there were definitely reasons for some of those and he would get back to us and so I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, but there's also another component where Dr. Taylor is creating a district operations manual. So this revision cycle of the curriculum will be included in that manual. Um, it also includes daily operations of the district. Uh, so regardless, this is kind of a living, you know, a living document, I suppose, that uh, we'll be using far into the future. Item number four in our curriculum meeting was discussion of the professional development for math teachers. And there was a, a paper done by one of our seniors, our high school seniors, Jean Semelwar. She wrote a paper for her Global Citizenship Project on math PD for um, high school math teachers specific to Highland Park. Her recommendations were discussed in our meeting and we all agreed that we should address the need for quality materials regarding textbooks that Jean highlighted in her paper. Um, apparently, our textbooks are riddled with errors. <laughs> Thank you, Lillian. <laughs> She's rolling her eyes. Yeah. So, one of one of the pieces in uh, uh, Jean's paper that I thought was enlightening was that in um, in other schools that she had studied, uh, I think they were Chinese schools. Teachers use the textbooks as a resource for their own edification. So this was a rich resource and it was not a shoddy product by any means. This was something that they could use um, in lots of different ways, but you know, something um, that was more of a reference tool. Apparently our textbooks are so bad that students can point out errors. Right, so this is, you know, 
it doesn't take a genius, I guess, to find, you know, errors. You're taking the course and you're looking at stuff and you're realizing this is wrong. That's pretty bad, you know. Um, so one of the things that we discussed was uh, looking into new textbooks of high quality. Um, another one of her findings was that quality pedagogy in math is hard to find. Imparting information to students while assessing student stress levels is a critical need for instructors to meet in the classroom. So another bullet point on our PD to-do list. Dr. Nikosha is engaged in the process of using Jean's paper to improve our high school math department's resources and pedagogy. Um, and Dr. Taylor mentioned that the lack of continuity is apparent in this particular area and we need to address continuity to help, this is continuity I'm assuming for the entire district, not just the high school math department, but continuity in math um, to help improve instruction in math district-wide, which is a subject area that builds on skills in a sequential manner. And we've all lived through everyday math. You know, we talked about that in our curriculum committee. Um, that seems to be the only thing that we're all unhappy with and is also the most, you know, continuous practice. Uh, so there's a lot of hope there. I, I felt like that was a really great discussion. And that is the end of my curriculum committee. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to see. Does anybody have any? Did you? I don't. I don't. I don't know if you hit all of the agenda items. As no, you I did not. Went through. Is, okay, yeah. maybe we should just it was give so, them a peruse. Yeah, let's do that quickly. Uh, yeah, I think I did. So field trip request is number two. Number three is the approval of the following teen center programs. Welcome Academy for incoming sixth graders and freshman orientation for incoming ninth graders. And uh, number four is the resolution to approve a full day of PD for reading intervention. Um, this was the QRI that we talked about in the report on June 15th. Number five is the resolution to approve the graduate students teaching internships, junior practicum observations. Number six is the resolution to approve the following teachers to participate in generous since training Thursday, June 1st, uh, which obviously this is after the fact. Um, number seven is the resolution to approve the extended school year, the ESY for special ed students, which will run from Wednesday, July 5th through Tuesday, August 8th, Monday through Thursday. The hours of operation will be 15 to 12.15 in Irvin Primary School and 8.30 to 12.30 in the middle school. One thing I want to add uh, to, the, to the curriculum committee, you brought up the good idea to see if we can do the Welcome Academy and freshman orientation a little later, closer to September. However, the problem with that is it gets close. It, it runs into the beginning of the professional development round for um, all of our staff when they come back. And right now, we wouldn't have the staffing to, to do it. But they're looking at potentially doing it in 18 for the next summer. So we'll look to see if we can do this in September of 2018. Yeah. They're just falling deaf ears. Yeah. If I can also ask, I had previously asked about trying to get information out about the um, summer program earlier. Um, during, you know, most, most parents are planning out their summer for their students. We have, we're in a very faculty heavy town. So we have a lot of people who work on 10 month lines. And so they're gone for the summer. They won't return until September. So we'll have a lot of students that won't be participating because of that. So if there's any way we can work with our teen center, just like what I'm asking us to work um, with our staff to try to get information out about which students are being recommended for the summer program earlier and um, the dates of that program, if we can work with the teen center in the same way to try to get those dates set for 2018 well in advance um, so that, well, what will be the fifth grade parents and the eighth grade parents, right? Yeah, um, will be able to make sure to sketch out vacation times that don't <coughs> cross into those orientations. Because I know my, my kid's not gonna be here. <laughs> so. And along those lines, I mean, I, I'd like us to still think a little bit more about these dates because incoming sixth grade, incoming ninth grade, that's really important. Like, that's information we want to get to those parents and we want to get to those students. So, I mean, 
we've got cameras, we can live stream, we can, we can do, there are all kinds of things that we can do to, if parents can't be there physically, they can potentially watch a live stream, it can be recorded, it can be put up on the middle school, the high school website so parents can watch it. If they have questions, they can watch it later and they can be sent out via email to families. We have to figure out ways to get more parents involved. Otherwise, they walk into a new school building and they have no knowledge base. And that's alienating. Mm -hmm. It's alienating to the kids, it's alienating to the families. So just saying, you know, it's too busy to move it, we get to then take the next step of like, okay, so then how do we get more of this information to more people? And those are two ideas I came up with off the top of my head. There's probably mm -hmm. other just as good, if not better ideas. So I'd like us to think about it a little bit more other than just saying we can't do it for this year. We're gonna do it for next year because this is two whole classes worth of kids moving into new buildings that we want to feel, the parents to feel comfortable and the kids to feel comfortable. Uh, Darcy? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to make a, a short comment about the curriculum report. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to just really go into any depth on this right now. Perhaps we could uh, uh, put my comment on um, onto a future agenda, maybe uh, next week or in July. But um, over the last two weeks or so, for the first time, um, I heard about some of these new curriculum programs, like the Reader, Readers and Writers Workshop from K through five. <coughs> so I always thought it was the board's job to approve new curriculums. And this is a major new curriculum, but this is the first time that I have and probably most of the board members have heard about the program. So I would want to discuss with Dr. Taylor and the board, and again, we should do it in public, um, not now, it's, nine, it's not 10 after nine, um, and we have a lot more to do, but if we could put this on an agenda and discuss it in public, um, how, do we, how do we propose new curriculum and discuss new curriculum. And in fact, the board should vote on new curriculum, especially a new reading and writing program for K through five. But there's two or three others I, I just heard there for the first time or saw reading them for the first time. How do we do that in a way that the board actually votes on them? Because I don't think they should be in the schools without the board knowing what we're getting and v reviewing them and voting on them. So please I think it would be helpful to have the supervisors actually make a presentation about these programs. Would that be insightful? I think, I think the course has left the barn, though, right? We've, we're doing these programs. We've bought the programs. We're doing professional development on these programs. So I don't think it's these programs, although I would like to hear about these programs. But uh, what if the board heard a presentation on any of these new programs and said, you know, we don't want that. And people have gone through professional development, and it's the expectation they're replacing something. Well, I don't see how that would work now. Well, I, I would like a presentation on them, but I'm thinking of the future. You, you, we decide we're gonna have a new integrated math program going from K through 12. Um, I want the board to vote on that. That's one of our prime prerogatives as board members, is voting on curriculum. Um, and you know, in some states, uh, specific books are voted on. I'm not really asking for that, but I really would like to know that we've had the chance to review the curriculum, a major curriculum change, um, before it gets put into practice. And one of the major, you know, I can let you know, one of the major concerns that I've heard from multiple board members about this is pushing academic skills into lower and lower grades. There's a lot of concern about pushing reading and writing skills into kindergarten. Um, where traditionally that's not what kindergarten has been. There hasn't been an expectation historically of children having a, a specific level of reading attainment by the end of kindergarten. Kindergarten has been a creative curriculum. It's been a play-based curriculum. I don't think anybody at this, I see lots of nods. I don't think anybody at this table wants to see a movement away from that. So if that's what this curriculum is, I think we have to have a much broader based conversation about that um, and you know, I, I think the board is a pretty good litmus test for the community, and I think if we move towards pushing academic, hate this word, rigor, into <laughs> kindergarten, uh, uh, yes. there's going to be some blowback. But, but I, I didn't actually say that, but that is yes. a concern I, I have. <laughs> but I really am more concerned about I did say the, that. Uh, right, I, I'm more concerned about us not hear, even hearing about a curriculum. Exactly. You know, exactly. we hear about the budget because we have 
We have, we have budget presentations, and then the board votes on the budgets. That's another prerogative of the board. We're not doing that with curriculum. And I, I've kind of not talked about it. You know, the meetings go long, and, and it, it, you know, we have to get on to the next thing. But it's bothered me for a while as a general thing. And we should, we should start doing it. We should start doing it if it means we have to go longer, we have to get presentations from, uh, from our uh, supervisors, uh, so be it. But I don't think we should adopt a new program, and particularly with what Darcy said, which I wholeheartedly agree, agree to, with um, on, on kindergarten and pre-K and first grade. Um, and we're hearing the concerns, too, about the, uh, Dr. Delpit. You know, I, these are concerns the board should hear about before we adopt something. And we should vote. I feel we should vote right, on the curriculum. We're not right. voting on curriculum. And I think we should be voting on curriculum, like we vote on personnel, like we vote on the budget. Well, Mark, you do have to vote on curriculum. Any well, curriculum guide that I have to present I, will be voted on. But that, but that will be that will be voted on. But people have been trained in it, and they're expecting that we'll be doing that curriculum next year. It kind of the. There's a cart before the horse cart kind of well, the horse. The, yeah. to, to me, it's also the balance between the role of the experts in the field mm -hmm. who are implementing the best practices mm -hmm. and the accountability the board has to keep in place. So we can't, um, right, but we, I we get can't, it. I get where you're coming from. And I, I'll, it's, it's, I think the expert versus administrator thing can be, or expert versus board member thing can be dealt with in the context of changing the timing a little bit. I mean, we're always going to respect your expertise as an expert, right. but we also have a role as you know as the board, community voice of the community, yeah. blah blah blah. And I think it would also, you know, number one, it's a, a democratic issue. But number two, it's, it probably would behoove you to use us, as Darcy said, as a litmus test, because if we have concerns about the increasing academization or whatever of kindergarten, you can bet that the rest of the com that many others in the community will also have that problem. Some won't, but there's many that will. I think I'll have to find ways to efficiently introduce, put more focus on curriculum in the board meeting setting than I have in the past. I have no problem with that at all. And I don't profess to be the expert. I leave it to Ms. Ackley and Dr. Nikosha to be the experts in those areas. But we need to I get just, our timing right. Right. Yes. That's yes. The I know, I know. Right, I know. Well, well, maybe I need to um, do a little less of my own presenting and pass that baton to somebody, uh, somebody else. No, Even if I were to alternate them to come to, to, for a program spotlight. Maybe right the program idea. spotlight could be based on a curriculum initiative that we're looking at. Teachers College reading writing workshop or I mean it'd be great if we could have some easier the thing that, that Mark is asking for is, you know, before a commitment is made. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Before that commitment is made, because we have a responsibility to the community of Highland Park, to the borough of Highland Park, the taxpayers of this town. To, to be looking at what it is we are instituting and to make sure that their money is being well spent. We're not going to question you in terms of the, the, you know, it's not that we're looking to question the, the expertise of the teachers, but we want the opportunity to ask questions in a public forum so that we are familiar with what it is that you're asking for us to pay for. And the town has the opportunity to listen to that information as well and know that its money is being well spent. If it's done the other way around, then basically you're making the decision for the town without the board's approval. Because if we're approving after the fact, then really we're not involved in that process at all at a point where we actually can give any input. The decision's made, the money is spent, so then what's the point of us giving the check off? Well, and the, with this one, I think it was able to get through so far because there wasn't a large expense involved. No, so right, it, right. it just kind of sailed through and then all of a sudden we're like, wait, we're doing this K through five? How did that happen? Like when there's a big price tag attached, often we'll catch it faster. But this one, there was no, it was like there wasn't a, that there wasn't that like fallback of like, hey, wait, what's this big <laughs> expense we're being asked right. to I mean, I have to, to say approve. as the curriculum committee head, I had understood that this was the program that we had always had, even though I've never heard the title before, because there was no expense attached and there was no discussion, you know, of finances attached to this, I completely misunderstood. I mean, well, readers and writers workshop. Some that, classrooms have used that yeah, for years. I, I I don't, I'm not really sure what, where we are in this process. Right. So I think that that is the case, that some classrooms yeah. had been using it for many, many years. 
and now it had been something that we had decided, not we as a board, but you know, the administration had decided was, you know, going to be implemented across all of our, our grades, K through five. Yeah, so K is new, right? K is new K is as far as I'm sure. concerned. Yeah. I, I did not understand do do that. Okay, and so I, I think on this one we've made, no, 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 it's okay. I'm just looking at the clock and we've got like a lot more to do. So I think we've made our point clear on this one that we'd like more information about this, about this program in particular and then that we can then extrapolate this situation out to other things that before we're presented with a curriculum whether or not there's a financial piece attached we'd like to be you know we'd like to be in the loop before it's it's you know pd is already happening and all these things understood are, and respected the horse has already left the barn can i, can I also just add one thing uh, please the, do the, the, well this, this will be very brief but on the uh, the last item regarding the math um math books i'd like to give uh kudos oh, to oh. the uh High school senior oh, she did who job. seems did to be pointing something day. out that we're not even talking about. Yeah. We right. hadn't talked about. Right. I don't know whether the uh, staff and the teachers have been talking about, but I, I, I do want to point that out. I yes. think that's great that's right. that, a, that a student has yes. uh, pointed that out to yes. us. This yeah, isn't a particularly astute math student wow. who this is like this wow. is her thing. Just so happens to be our valedictorian as well. Oh, wow. Aw, let that cat right out of the bag. <laughs> That was let out last week okay. at Senior Awards. So before we move on to finance, I'll just quickly introduce somebody. Oh, yes, please. So you probably wondered who uh, this person is. She wasn't sitting here for a school project. She's actually <laughs> one of our next board representatives, Olivia Estes. I told Olivia to stick around uh, a while so she could get a sense of how the board operates. I think she got a strong sense of how the board <laughs> operates. We'll go have to take and it out of And I told her she needed to get... <laughs> Do you drink coffee? Olivia is, Olivia is very involved in um, Model UN in Congress. And they're, are they still having the function? Oh, oh well. But uh, you're, I think you're welcome to leave at this point if you'd like. If that's okay, Mrs. Superbursi. Um, <laughs> it's like, I'll walk you out. <laughs> Julia LaBelle will be the other representative. She'll be here on the 19th. They each could make the same night, so that's why they're alternating. We'll induct them in September. I think on September 11th, of all dates, is our first meeting. So thanks, Olivia, for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. And we'll still see you next week, right, Lillian? Yeah. Okay. Yay. Yay. And you'll see Michelle next week, too. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. Bye. Have a good night. Night. All right, so we will move on to finance and facilities. Mark. Yes. Who's going to like, I have a feeling gonna he's going to be like speed reading. <laughs> no, what, so what happened yesterday is, is Rob R. C sent a long Rob list, R. a long list of questions, and I'm going to. But with Linda's okay. help, we're going to go through this list and answer them. At 11 o'clock at night. No, no, we're going to do this quickly. So, um, items one through three are the usual, uh, the, the usual bill lists and travel reimbursements. Rob, to your question about the uh, travel to New York, that's a multi-day event, and that includes trains and, and parking at the stations, which is much less than driving into New York. So that's why the expenses were what they were. Uh, items four, th uh, four through six are the board attorney, the bond uh, agent, and the district auditor. So we're approving those, approving those for next year. The uh, contractors in number seven are, for the most part, for the summer. Uh, there, there's one error. The last, uh, the last name, Rebecca Peckman, should only have one date range associated with her, and that's seven one seventeen through six thirty, eighteen. So the first date range that should be crossed out. So that, that's through the year. That's yeah, that is through the year. But, okay. but they, uh, we're approving them f through the year. But some of these will be approved. Uh, we're, we're only approving for, for the summer. Like the Educational Services Commission uh, will have different kinds of rates during the year. Okay. Um, we'll see those on, uh, and I think this is part of uh, Rob's question on July. I'm sorry, on June. 19th of the next meeting, we're going to get rates for them for during this school year, as opposed to these rates, which are their summer rates, apparently. It's complicated. Um, so I, wait, all of, I'm sorry, Mark, all of these do run through next year? They do they, run through oh, okay. next year. They do. I'm sorry, I thought you said do. just no, summer. They do. Um, 
the one that doesn't is the Invo, Invo Health Care. Right, right, right. But okay. uh, while they all do the Educational Services Committee, a commission which uh, Rob had asked, uh, oh, I, I believe this is the one you asked about, why aren't they the, um, the, um, uh, the fixed rates as opposed to the hourly rates? And uh, what Linda said, I think I have this right, Linda, that in, on, the, on our next meeting we're going to get a different set of rates for them? Or did I misunderstand you? Um, on item number seven so for the Educational maybe. Services Commission. Mm -hmm. Right, a full listing of their services will be presented on the, oh, I'm sorry, on the July board agenda at the usual set evaluation rate. So we will get another set of rates for the ESC. That's on your report you sent to the committee earlier today. Third item, uh, uh, items seven and eight. Right, because so I think it was these are the fill-in rates for when ESC does not have the staffing to perform the evaluation. Correct. So we're going to get those rates in our July Cor meeting. Correct. That's right. Because ESC um, is doing a lot of uh, for non-public and schools. So right. there's there's a there's a it was multi levels going That's right. on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me go on uh, the. Um, 9 through 11 are uh, out-of-district placements. Uh, 12 and 13 are uh, transportation renewals. Um, item 14 is Borough and Teen Center partnering for a joint peer mentoring program, partially funded by this grant. Bur uh, Highland Park Borough gives a hoot. Uh, item 15 um, is the uh, agree, an agreement uh, we've made with Temco, our maintenance and custodial group, uh, to the amount of 31,000 and change. Um, th that's because uh, Temco was sued by employees for prevailing benefits. And we would have owed $96,000, but bargained that down to $31,000. That will go away next year. We are uh, in the process of hiring uh, the two maintenance uh, people um, who require prevailing wages and prevailing benefits from Temco. They're going to be uh, H uh, Highland Park uh, 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 employees. Uh, so we won't have this prevailing wage and prevailing benefit uh, issue in the future. Item 16 and 17 are submissions of grant of grants applications for IDEA and SBYSP and their annual submissions. Um, items 18 through 21 are transfers to emergency reserve, capital reserve, um, and um, interim uh, budget transfers. Uh, as well as paying the obligations for the school year. Uh, they're the typical end of year um, uh, reserve uh, transfers. Um, we are going, to, uh, Linda will be putting a motion on the next agenda to establish a maintenance reserve, which our auditor suggested. And what we discussed in, um, in the um, finance committee meeting was uh, the maintenance reserve, the capital reserve, and the monies, uh, money, monies for next year's budget, and the capital reserve, I think I might have missed one, emergency reserve, maintenance reserve, capital reserve, and anticipated surplus for next year, all of those have money in the account so that we will be able to sufficiently fund them. Okay, onward. So I'm up to, let's see, 22 is a student, uh, a student uh, summer placements. Item 23 is the membership in the um, NJSIAA, the Athletic Association. Items 24 and 25 
are proposals to uh, repair the fence surrounding the football track and football field. 26 and 27 is, is the screening and finishing of the wood floors, which yes, we do every year because they get a lot of uh, uh, hard use. Items 28 and 29 are contract, uh, sorry, uh, a contract for concrete sidewalk repair. Um, items 30 and 31 are the, uh, high, uh, the uh, high density access point in the cafeteria. And yes, it's the cafeteria because the kids are gonna go to the cafeteria when they need a substitute. So this, there'll be one sub or maybe multiple subs in the cafeteria and the kids will be able to use their computers in there and, and um, you know, access the net. Um, item 32 is the Temco contract uh, renewal. It's at a rate of 3%, which is the CPI rate. And uh, last year's CPI was very low, it was only half a point, which you pointed out, Rob. Um, the contract will decrease by $200,000 um, because we anticipate putting the, these, the two uh, maintenance staff on, on our payroll uh, with uh, 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 considerable savings. And then, uh, where am I? Item 33 is the contract renewal with the educational data services. Uh, they do bulk cooperative bidding uh, for districts around the state, and we save considerable amount of money working with them. So that's the full report. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mark? I'm going to take a breath now. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question. No, you're oh. not allowed. <laughs> you're, 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 you're questioned <laughs> out, Rob. <laughs> Sorry. On, uh, 24 and 25, the chain link fence around the sports field. It's... Uh, uh, 2700 have we looked at exploring whether or not we can get any funding through the uh, county because isn't isn't that a shared facility the the, the, the track the, itself the track was certainly built with uh, shared with money from, from but it's now the it's us in the borough not the county the no, county the, the, okay. the county yeah. doesn't have anything to do with it at this point. Oh, okay so then it's just gonna go nowhere all right it's coming out of your taxes either way buddy. either way <laughs> yeah <laughs> Our budget are theirs. Pick. By the way, the groaning notwithstanding, I appreciated your, the, the, <laughs> the questions that uh, was helpful with we are always Linda happy going for through them. Actually, speaking of questions, um, uh, there's been, you know, as most people hopefully know already, tomorrow we'll be having half day because of the heat, and this triggered a lot of emails um, and phone calls back and forth today about the district's status in terms of air conditioning not air conditioning what have we done what are we doing so could we give like a little I, this I would could. be a good time i think to give a little update on where we're at what our plans are and yes um so i want to thank linda and scott both for filling us in um we uh we've appropriated for this coming year out of the capital reserves um close to a hundred thousand dollars it's not quite a hundred thousand for uh, five major compressor units which will serve 10 classrooms at the Bartle School. So 10 more classrooms at Bartle will get more? It's actually um, some classrooms at Bartle and some at the high school. Oh, part, yes. Yeah, they're prioritizing Oh, I thought it was Bartle, basic. okay. Okay, thanks, Linda. So, so, uh, as, so, but there will be 10 classrooms done. Uh, we had the number earlier today and it's, uh, I think, something like 60 classrooms. 40 are still without. Are still without, yeah. without? Is it, it was a surprise number. Is it number. lower than that now, Linda? There was, and what was surprising to me was there were more at the high school than at yeah. Bartle, which I didn't realize. Yeah, there's no, there's no 46. And that includes three that are broken. They're not. So it's without. 43. So the plan is over the next, I'm going to say, to be. That would be three years. Clear, yeah. three to four years of budgets like that from capital, all of the rooms that don't have air conditioning will have air conditioning. And I, I mean, this is no great solace, but it's a far cry from 25 years ago when nothing had air conditioning. So boards over the years have funded this and we have come a very long way. That's in no way to say it's at all good that any classroom doesn't have it. But there's a plan in place. Um, it was one of the items, um, we double-checked this earlier today, it's one of the items that was not dropped 
when we were going over the budget discussions, we did keep the money in uh, because people feel this way when it gets yeah. hot like this. Uh, so in the next, and it's weeks. I mean, it's weeks of instruction at the terrible. beginning of the no, year. It's we weeks of instruction at the to, end of the year. We can it's use terrible. that to, to bring staff here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, but we are moving. We are moving on it. And I, I did see today also a number of articles pop up, um, one on NJ.com about you know putting additional pressure on the legislature to do because I mean clearly this is not you know a Highland Park problem. You know this is a New Jersey problem. There are a lot of old school buildings, a lot of failing infrastructure, um, and so I mean I'll, I'll keep my eyes open if it looks like there's any legislative solution here or you know will to do something about that you know maybe we can do a resolution that we try to get pushed around the state to support and any legislator that you know comes forward with some sort of reasonable res uh, les legislation on this i mean I, I think states should i mean if states can help with you know lead water te the state can help with lead water testing i think they can help with this as well so Darcy, just to put it on your radar i i temp worked for um NJ uh, Work Environment Council, and they have a program called Healthy Schools Now, yeah, yeah. which I'm sure that you know yep. we've heard of before. But this is one of those items that they would be, you know, they would put that on on their newsletter, yeah. you know, about any legislation coming down the pipe, yep, about you know this type of thing, yeah. infrastructure and building health. This would be a good one. This would be it. Okay, so if nobody else has any questions for Mark, we will move on to personnel uh, and communication with Judy. Okay, um, so we did meet. Um, let's go over what we talked about. Um, we did um, talk about the need for a new uh, part-time special ed teacher um, because of the uh, increase of students um, being, well, because the students are being tested for uh, dyslexia, uh, we need to have somebody that is trained to um, assist in that area. So that was one uh, item we talked about. Um, we also went over some uh, updates with personnel. We have had no luck still with our middle school French teacher search. Um, four candidates were interviewed, um, but we did not have any success in uh, hiring anybody. So we're, we're just at a standstill with that. Um, as far as the Irving and Bartle media specialist positions, um, we do have three candidates being interviewed on June 27th um, from a total of eight candidates that applied. For an English, um, we, we have a position open also for English language learner teacher. Seven candidates are being interviewed um, on the 12th of this month, um, and we had 19 total candidates apply. So that's where we stand with that. We do have some, um, New personnel on the agenda, which is good to report. Let me jump to that. Um, we have hired the, um, oh, where is it? Oh, okay, here we go. Number 24, we have a um, resolution uh, to approve the uh, math teacher uh, at the middle school, Rebecca, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Unanced. Um, uh, step four on the scale, um, pending criminal history background check. Um, we also have a uh, Bartle elementary teacher that we hired, Mary Frances Pruno, or it's on the agenda to hire her. And then um, happily we have found a physics teacher for the um, high school, and that's number 26. So that was wonderful because um, some of the teachers that have, um, we've interviewed have had competing offers so uh, Scott had to woo them here with special tours and the like Took um, to the Rutgers <laughs> Club. No. but we have three that will be uh, that will be approving so that was our good news uh, let's see what else okay let me go through the agenda and nothing else was really critical Um, okay, so we have the resolution to approve source for teacher subs. I think that was an error on the agenda. It should be 2017-18 school year. That makes more sense. Okay. Yeah, that's um, correct. Then number three, uh, we have a list of 
all of the Schedule B appointments that goes on for pages and pages. Scott, we're just approving the the names, correct? Not the salaries. Correct. That's salaries are contingent upon uh, resolution of the contract. Okay. Um, number four, resolution to approve summer band camp director. Um, five is the Spanish translator for the district, Mr. Esteban. Um, number six, we have our athletic site manager. Lots of just different appointments of volunteer team doctor, coach aides, um, school physician, Spanish translator for the child study team. Um, we have appointed our gender equity officer, Jen Knapp, our homeless liaison, Didi Deacher, um, and Ms. Boudin for the American with Disabilities Act officer, number 13. Um, Mr. Gervin is the Title IX officer, um, ESL program officer number 15, safety officer is Scott. Um, uh, Mr. Harper um, received his MA, so now he's moving up on the salary guide. Um, and then we have number 18, resolution to approve the following employment of teacher associates from July to June 30th, two, uh, 2018. Once again, salaries may be uh, revised upon contract negotiations. Uh, number 19 is all of the paras, which goes on for pages and pages. <laughs> <laughs> and more paras to assist with the Irving picnic. Um, 21 are the um, staff members who will be working summer hours. Um, looks like a lot of the guidance staff, um, guidance counselors. Wow, this is really long. Um, <laughs> before and after school program staff for 2017-18. Summer secretary subs. And then, as I mentioned, the hires. Um, number 27 is the resolution to approve the increase um, just by a little bit for the part-time art teacher from 40 to 50%. And we have a resignation of a lunch para. Then, let's see, lunch, oh, two of them, okay. And number 30, resolution to uh, approve staff member professional development in sheltered instruction, 31 uh, curriculum staff writing hours. This will never end. <laughs> it does, it does. I don't know, up to 33, come on, we can do it. Um, 33, summer hours for uh, Jen Knapp. Um, 34, resolution to appoint Lauren Dobity as a sub for the summer program. And there, yes. Um, Resolution to appoint um, Mr. Lobianco as a sub also for the Summer Holistic Intervention Program. And then 36 is staff who will participate in the International Institute of Restorative Practices during August. 37, I didn't know what that was actually. What is lab That's as a, training? Those are just additional instructional strategies. Okay. Thank high school you. teachers can be uh, using middle and high school. Okay, so that's on there. And number 38, uh, discipline study group. Um, and, oh, we talked about this before, about more staff training for the uh, Genesis. And number 40 is continues of Genesis. 41 is um, approval of additional hours for Michael Nastas, who is a para at the middle school. Um, for st a special ed student if he w wants to participate in after school activities. Um, 42 is a salary adjustment for uh, Ms. Nicosia. Um, 43 is all the extended school year employment. So you'll see that go on for a couple of pages. Child study team meetings over the summer. Those hours are approved there. ESL screening for summer employment. 46 is appointing the treasurer of school monies, Dr. Brian Falkowski. And 47, 48. 
And then it looks like we have a disability leave extension and an uh, approvement, approving an unpaid family leave also, number 50. And, okay. and Judy, I'm sorry, Linda pointed out that there was a, oh, a yes, correction I'm sorry, to Linda. a... Yes, a number 19, uh, Patricia Allende, um, that should say $14.70 as the uh, hourly rate. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Anybody have any questions for Judy? Nope. Just a word about the candidates who are recommending for full-time employment next year, the three of them. Rebecca Unes is the math teacher at the middle school. She spent a year as a maternity leave replacement, did a phenomenal job. Uh, she came yes, in. I second that. What's that? <laughs> I, I second that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a chance to actually sit in our class when I was a middle school student for a day, so I got a couple of perspectives. Anyway, she's a hands down an amazing person, teacher. Um, Randy Post is the physics teacher we would uh, like to hire. His, uh, I'm not going to read everything. His supervisor said a couple of things that stood out, though. Very good with the kids, very personable, has a lot of patience. He obviously knows his content. Um, Mary Prugno is um, an elementary teacher we're recommending. This will be her first position. Her student teaching supervisor said she was quite brilliant, mm -hmm. extremely reflective, more than any other student teacher I ever had. And she goes on and on. Has a great rapport with the students. So we're really excited about that. Um, but there were the other districts interested in both Mary and Randy. So after a couple of school tours, blah, 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 we were able to attract their <laughs> services. Tell them we'll have air conditioning within the next three years. Three, three and a half years. That's, <laughs> right. that's what you need. That's, that's the selling right. point from now so on. Sure we Fully air in. conditioned. We're it's good. in the plan. <laughs> I have one question for Judy, just a quick one. The difference between a teacher associate and a paraprofessional, I've never known According what that According to means. Scott, it was don't 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 even uh, education. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, the chuckle from the back of the room yeah. was really just. I know what I was told. Come grab the microphone. Uh, that's why you want to sit all the way back there, right? Like you're hovering over yeah. us. I asked the same thing. Um, I, I can, I can, I can't answer. <laughs> Seriously? I can't. It's too late. Um, we'll get back to you. Okay. It's a subtle. I, no, um, uh, probably a dozen years ago, uh, a, board, a board came up with the position of teacher associate. It's not, in, it's not a, a position that's in the, apparently in the um, state guidelines for uh, uh, positions of, uh, in school districts. You know, teacher and a superintendent and so on are, but teacher associate was a new one that I think Highland Park invented um, and it was for no it's for folks with um, um, a, a, a significant amount of education but who uh, aren't certified as teachers mm -hmm. and so the district uh, wants to have these people and is paying them uh, more uh, than a paraprofessional and they have uh, different uh, and more expanded duties than paraprofessionals. So I'm s sorry about the little laughter attack there. <laughs> but it, it was uh, certainly something uh, that Keith and I um, discussed um, uh, a lot. We're, we are no longer hiring new uh, teacher associates. Correct. Like, we are like, no longer uh, hiring that's, that's teacher associates. That's a, uh, it, I yes. believe. It that's is, right. it is, and, oh, okay. and when I, when I, uh, when we invoke the doctrine of necessity uh, to discuss the contract so love that. negotiations, I'll explain this in great detail. It's like a protective that's bubble goes over the room we're, we're in. Up, because <laughs> it is something I, that it, it, I can't discuss the okay, details of at the moment. Excellent. But when we vote uh, next week, I, I, before we Thank vote you. next week, I discuss <laughs> All right, so if no one else has any questions for Mark, we're going to... I have a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, for Judy, not for Mark. Sorry, for Judy, Judy, yeah. Judy, Judy. And I, I'm not sure if you have I just went backwards, that was bad. In, in terms of the paraprofessionals, are they all under the same job description, even though the positions are determined, like special ed, job coach, lunch, or clerical? Yeah. Are there, mm -hmm. are there separate question. job descriptions for each of those? There things? are for clerical and, that they're, and for classroom based and as there are for lunch okay. Paris as well all right thank you 
Okay, so uh, we are going to move on to policies and regulations with Anne. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. Yeah, well, it's going to be quick. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going to. Don't worry, I'm not going to read through all of these policies. So um, we did meet on May 22nd. We did. Um, and who was not there? Who exempted himself? Ah, Mark. Mark took I the volunteered. sacrificed Mark himself. Sword. Yes, fell on his sword so that we wouldn't be a quorum. Um, I didn't uh, put minutes together. Um, not entirely out of uh, lack of organization, uh, but mainly because uh, the minutes weren't that exciting. We, we basically, it was basically a sort of a workman-like meeting. We went through some of the policies, the many, many policies that Strauss Esme believes we are out of date on, and this sort of divided up the workload, and we got through a bunch of them, which uh, are now on the agenda. Um, these fall in the category of our not very controversial policies, at least unless, Drums. until, what, drones? <laughs> Well, drones can be controversial, but I don't think this policy is terribly controversial. Um, and, you know, until one of you comes up with a controversy they want to raise tonight or at another time. Um, so 1220, uh, employment of chief school administrator, AKA Scott. Uh, this is a recommended revision to our current policy. And Susan Odato has prepared the uh, document on the drive to show what has changed and what has not. There's not that much that's interesting there. Um, Stress Estimate had a weird recommendation. If there is a superintendent vacancy at the time that we transition to new board members, it, it has not been filled at the end of the year. It's the new, Strauss Estimate wanted us to decide that the old board, the board in existence at the time that the vacancy you know, became a vacancy, those guys would come back and vote for the new superintendent, it was very strange. So we, we cut that out and we uh, decided that whatever board is there at the time that we find a superintendent candidate, that board will confer as to the identity of the candidate. It was just very strange. And we had to call back all those other board members and Probably you'd have to sit out. Probably to legal challenge to uh, it, bring back old board members who aren't sworn in. That's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, it's insane. So maybe it was a typo or something? I, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, clearly some old board members were agitating with stress <laughs> Esme to <laughs> make sure. Old board members activists. I don't know who they are. Um, okay, 1310, employment of school business administrator. Um, most of these changes are proposed by stress Esme. Uh, we added some stuff in paragraph number three about having uh, the most suitable candidate being referred to the personnel committee. Um, so in other words, uh, once Scott finds a suitable candidate, the most suitable candidate, the, the personnel committee would consider that person before the full board considered him or her. But hopefully we will not be in that position for a long, long, long time. Linda, because Linda is never going to retire. Uh, especially not after this meeting, she right? Never go to Time is light. Come on, we, yeah. Linda has been kept at meetings far longer oh, than oh, this. I know. This is Linda's like, come on, you're not even trying. This is like pre-K for me. She's fine. She, okay, uh, fifteen thirty. Equal employment opportunities. Uh, the document on the drive prepared by Susan shows the changes. Um, Oh, uh, so we added the TGNEC language from our transgender policy. I, I still don't know yeah. exactly what. Because it's wrong. Because it's wrong. <laughs> and I think Stephanie and Lauren like even acknowledged that like right after we adopted the policy, uh, they're like, oh yeah, that's not right. So I think we should reach should out to them. I think, oh, okay. I think what they ended up, it should, the E and the C are supposed right. to be switched. Yes. C, E, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, and I actually, I, I got called on this on that Alan Combs radio show. He's like, so T-G-N-E-C, I haven't heard that one before. You're and that Alan was Combs? already after. Yeah, your husband got me on Alan Combs B right after the whole, anyway. anyway. The late, and I was like. Now, now the late Alan Combs. I know, now the late Alan Combs, so yes, tragic. But I, I was like, uh, well, yeah, well. It was, yeah, not fun. So yeah, that's not right. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, change that around yes. for the next agenda. and. Um, Perhaps I should do it on the transgender policy too. It's just a clerical change. Yes. Okay. If I could just, you know, say why that change. Yeah, sure. Go. Yes, please. So transgender is a term that uh, people would use when like, it just imparts that there is a 100% commitment, you know, <laughs> to identifying as 100% female or 100% male. So it is talking about a binary. That's what it, uh, that term. It, why it's antiquated. Okay. So the new term is acknowledging that there is a spectrum. There are people that do not identify um, particularly with any gender. Right. And so that new term is now indicative of the spectrum rather than the binary. Mm -hmm. 
So let me what? make sure I understand what all the, I get that. I me make sure I know what all the letters stand for. So it's transgender, the N is for gender nonconforming? Transgender is the no. T, and gender nonconforming. Oh, G-N-C. -N -C. I thought maybe that was. G-N-C. Oh, G-N-C. Yeah, G -G so T is, is for transgender. Oh, G-N-C is nonconforming, okay. So well, gender nonconforming. Right. right. And E for expansive. And then expansive. the E for expansive. Expansive, sorry. Right. Okay, yeah, so, so people got more the letters. Just got Swapped somewhere. And so this is why the rainbow is the, the symbol of the, and the, the, it's just every single possibility. <laughs> and this is one of the Covering cases I think when we were so busy looking at the big picture yeah, that sure. we missed the little details. That's right. And okay. then well, we're we have taking a over the alphabet, the all the colors, yeah. <laughs> every single letter. All right, let's move okay, on. People. So we're gonna change that. Um, let's see. Uh, in paragraph, let's see. This is equal employment opportunities for uh, hiring staff. Obviously, not for students. So let's see. We're in paragraph one, two, three, four, five. Wait, where are you? I'm in uh, oh, 15, oh, I'm sorry, I'm back on equal employment opportunity, <laughs> okay. 1530. Uh, paragraph five was uh, the personnel committee's addition. Um, we just want to uh, encourage the administration to continue with uh, what it's doing now and to expand those efforts to employ a broader recruitment strategy um, to attract some underrepresented groups. Um, that's something that I think that uh, Scott and the administration has begun to do and we hope to see that, that effort expanded. Uh, as much as possible. Um, okay, next up is employment contract, 3124. It's all about employment contracts. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. I'm gonna uh, add a comma in there at one point. You'll see that comma <laughs> next time around. I'll be looking for be a Be on the lookout for a comma. Um, so this is, uh, we had this policy before. We, um, Stress Estimate recommended that we scratch paragraph three. And I think, why did we do this? Look. Oh, I think we didn't, um, we figured everybody's represented by a collective bargaining agreement, except for, I don't know why we agreed to that. But I think we didn't think it was very controversial. And I think uh, we believe the administration would successfully put into people's contracts who are not covered by a union contract, by, by a union uh, agreement, a provision for termination. We didn't think it was necessary. If others have concerns about that, of course. Um, okay, employment of teaching staff members, 3125. Uh, there's, some there's some changes around in the administrative code citations. There's a new paragraph, uh, I, which I believe brings us into conformance with the law. So nothing too controversial there. Mark, we should probably look at it again. I guess we did look at it in light of our new substitute, the ideas that we're having about substitutes. I, I don't think it's con I don't think it contradicts that though. Okay. Yeah, I'll check it out one more time. Yeah, it okay. okay. Did we talk about that? I can't yeah, we did it, but I don't think it does. I don't think it does. Okay. Uh, three one two five point two employment of substitute teachers. Um, a lot of this pertains to the direct hiring of substitutes by a district. We uh, at at present we uh, employ a contractor, of course, source for teachers that provides our substitutes. So most of this is not uh, applicable to Highland Park's current practice. However, it's in there in case we decide to change our current practice. Um, there are a number of typos in paragraph one, two, three, four, five, which I will be fixing up uh, and uh, putting forward for your review at our voting meeting. Um, second page, also self-explanatory, typo or two. And that's it, okay, chapter, uh, sorry, policy 3141, resignation. Uh, it's an old policy, a few changes, there we go. Um, changes recommended by stress SMA that we did not find controversial. Uh, chapter 3282, use of social networking sites. Um, this is a new policy for us, actually. I was not clear enough with, with poor Susan, who put in all these changes. I think these are the changes, the, the, the markings indicate where the personnel committee changed things from Strauss, where we changed Strauss SMA's recommended policy. So the, the strikeouts are things that Strauss SMA recommended that we did not agree with. Um, I believe that's, that's what that represents. Anyway, that's a new policy. Um, we took a lot of time dealing with page two of three. Uh, we felt that the, um, the prohibitions on staff use of personal social networking sites were a little vague and uh, uh, overwielding. That's not the right word. Uh, <laughs> vague and intrusive. There were things like, staff members shall not say anything on social media that the commissioner of education would find inappropriate. That seemed awfully general and you know, left a lot of room for discretion. Is, yeah, yeah right, I mean, what does the commissioner of education think is appropriate? He hates peanut butter. Right, he hates peanut butter, so, right, there you go. So, so you can see we tried to um, limit it to things that we actually thought were problematic. 
Um, so folks should look at that and let me know if there's anything. Okay, chapter 40, uh, sorry, policy 4282. Same thing now applicable to support staff members. 3282 is teachers. Um, same thing, the changes I believe here, the marked up changes show where we disagreed. We, the policy committee, disagreed with Strauss Esme. Let's see. Okay, chapter, oh, here we go, Ruth. 7481, unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, also known as drones, in all caps. <laughs> this is recommended to us by Strauss Esme. Um, we carefully reviewed it, we actually did carefully review it. There are some options um, that we checked off. Uh, Basically, we left it to Scott to decide if it was okay. Exactly, right. <laughs> we had a little discussion about whether kids should be allowed to go with their, their parents and you know, fly drones on the football field on the weekend, and we decided no, we would go with Stress Esme's recommendation that that would not be allowed. Um, uh, so with the, the optional parts are at the bottom of page, uh, page one. There are some instances in which the board may authorize the use of an unmanned aircraft system, <laughs> namely if it's, a, uh, <laughs> if it's related to a school project um, or if it's for some other reason approved by us. So there's not gonna be a lot of drones flying around unless we know about it first or unless <laughs> Scott approves the use of such Thank a drone goodness, in a school project. Taken care of I know. Yes. But what about Amazon drones dropping our supplies off? Uh, uh, this could be it could be, they're not a, <laughs> that's a good question actually. This doesn't deal with uh, Scott delivery drones. Okay. Delivery drones. <laughs> it actually doesn't deal with that, it deals with contractors Amazon's not a contractor, they're like a third party. When that comes, becomes a problem, we will readdress the there, drones. There will be drones. There will be drones. Yes. Yeah, there will be drones. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare yourselves. Um, okay, oh God, here we go. Chapter, uh, so, why do I keep saying chapter? I think it's a statue. 8630, chop chop everybody. This is pretty exciting stuff. Bus driver responsibility. All right, we don't have a lot of buses and bus drivers, but we do have some. So these are um, amendments to our, amendments recommended by Strauss Esme as modified in some cases by the personnel committee to our current policy about bus driver responsibilities. Um, there are actually a number of typos and missing paragraphs from this. I think uh, there may have been a miscommunication between the uh, well, head of the policy committee and the person who types up the <laughs> policy committee's recommendations. Um, I, I'll just say very briefly, and then you guys can look at this on your own. Paragraph three is all crossed out. That's not supposed to be crossed out. That's supposed to be in. Then after paragraph three, there's a paragraph that got deleted about school bus drivers and bus aides receiving training in the use of a student's educational records and ensuring the privacy of student records. I'm not sure exactly what that means. I guess, you know, if you know something confidential about a student, you shouldn't yell it out on the bus or, you know, tell your family about it. Um, but anyway, that seems to be a new, uh, I believe that's a new requirement of New Jersey law. Okay. Um, page two, the third full paragraph. That is not a deletion. That should be an addition. Uh, stu uh, in the second full paragraph, students do not have to have school bus evacuation drills, just school, bu school bus evacuation instruction. So I think that's a good change recommended by Stress Esme. We're not going to have drills, we're just going to talk about evacuation safety. Uh, 8690 is a new policy about monitoring devices on school vehicles. We currently do not have any monitoring devices on school vehicles, but if we do ever get them, this policy will apply to them. <laughs> and that's all I have. So they don't apply to the ones that we contract? Uh, I believe that, let me see, two seconds. Um, blah, 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 blah. It says the school board- School owned or contracted school vehicles. Right, 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 I'm sorry. The policy is completely permissive. It says the board may use devices to monitor and or observe. Right. Let's see, is there anything that's restrictive of them? Oh, I guess, you know what? That's a good point, actually. Um, I mean, I guess if any of our contracted school vehicles did have a video monitoring system, it would have sure to say video. Posted. Yeah, right. yeah, oh, that's well, right. Okay. Scott, are we, are we certain about that, that none of our, I mean, I think, I'm not sure where I got this information, actually. Are we sure that none of our contractors' buses have video monitoring systems? Or We're not sure of that. Do you happen to know? No, they certainly might. And, but oh. I, imagine, I believe that they would have that sign already. Okay. Can we just find out? I guess someone should sure. check and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure. I mean, I know that... Um, or we could not adopt this. 15 years ago, they had uh, either cameras on buses or... 
uh, boxes that may or may not hold a camera on those, <laughs> you know, just in the case. They might look a little bit You'll like a camera. You'll never know. Right. But it may deter you. Exactly. <laughs> so I will find out about the signs, though. Okay, okay. thanks. Or we could just not adopt this policy. That's anyway. so funny. Well, yeah, absolutely. whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing, the, the only other sort of well, uh, sort of item of real interest for the board, perhaps, is that Charisse, um, with, of course, whatever assistance she needs, is going to be collecting uh, sort of a list of policies that explicitly address equity concerns. You know, those are ones like the Comprehensive Equity Plan policy. Um, of course, all of our policies may have an indirect ancillary impact on equity. Um, and we're going to try to go through those all together so that we're not sort of looking at one equity policy at a time. And so this is our attempt to, you know, for once, not be going piecemeal through all of these policies. Um, and that will happen. Maybe we'll start doing that in July. Great. All right. That's it. All right. I'm Does out. anybody have any questions for Anne? Not questions, but um, I was looking at the policies, and under 3124, you removed the section related to resignation and or the 60-day notice. And I think that conflicts then, because 3141 under resignation refers back to 3124. Hold so on might, one You might want to look at 3141 and 3124 together. Where in 3124, oh, that thing. And the employment contract will also include a provision for unless the teaching staff member is, okay, and 3141 refers to that, let's see. Thank you, Rob. So you might want this to look is like this. looking at these together is, a, is an issue here. And then uh, just, a, just a general comment on 3282 and 4282. Yeah, I, I have very big reservations on changing the language from should not to may not. Hmm. Let's uh, see. So uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at it again. I'll read through it again. But my, uh, on my first read of it. The old may should conversation. Yeah. Those are always fun conversations. Yeah, it's, it's like I, I feel like the, the they may not becomes a very limiting and restrictive and I, I'm usually more comfortable with like, even though the should not is like, there's pretty stupid things to do that they should not do, but I feel like you, you have to give the flexibility for someone to to do that and when you when you have a something that's that restrictive. But I'll 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 take a look at it again and maybe I'm just Yeah, no, please do look at it again yeah. if you yeah, give me your if you have additional thoughts. I mean I, I really feel like we really do not want teachers to make statements that would violate any of our policies, including you know, posting material that would violate state or federal laws, disclose confidential information, or defame the district, or, you know, promote violence, or maybe and we I, took out promote violence. And I, I feel like way back when, when this policy, uh, the, the dates, I think, are on the bottom, I feel like there were some teachers who expressed concerns about the first time this was adopted. This uh, is a new policy, though. On the... 3282? It is. There was a, there was a policy we, in the... I, I believe we talked there, about it. I think it. that was one where there was... Prohibitions on teachers. Oh, uh, it was. It was different. It was, it was a different. There was prohibitions on like who they could friend and stuff like that. So I, I think that was that was the one I remember there being. Wow. Right. I'm trying to recall when that was and, I know. Like, and me, try to put it into context with this because that was like that's three years what. Ago, four years ago. I thought there was also one we discussed and never adopted. There was like a lot of discussion. We tabled it and there was like a whole like 25 policies we tabled and use that was it. Oh, is it appropriate use of technology? Yeah. So I, I, I just yeah. want to try to, between now and next week, try to find that and put it in the context between the May and Well, should. we have a very surf, uh, searchable database now. It should be, should be easy to find. should be. <laughs> All right, now check out what you said about 3141 and uh, the other one, whatever that one was. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Okay, so if there isn't anything else for Anne, we'll move on to equity and excellence with Sharice. Excellent. So as Anne said, <laughs> I'll be in the process of working on this uh, database. I sort of have the rough sketched database. Um, awesome. But it's very, very rough, and I'm still working on weeding out. Um, <clears throat> so we did meet, the Equity and Excellence Committee met on Tuesday, May 23rd. Um, Dr. Taylor, myself, Ruth, and uh, Rob Magaziner uh, were all in attendance. Our primary thing has been for these last two meetings going through the comprehensive equity uh, plan and the corrective actions that we sent to the state of New Jersey um, and you know we're trying to kind of focus in on updating what was submitted so that each year when we go to do our primary um, what do you call it uh, 
Yeah, I can't think anymore. Um, I would have to be last. <laughs> Statement of assurance. <laughs> Statement of assurance. Um, that it will be a lot easier each subsequent year because it will have been kept up to date all throughout the year. Um, so we, you know, talked about um, planning to meet on several occasions with uh, Jen Knapp, who's our affirmative action officer, and with uh, Scott um, to make sure that we're maintaining compliance with the plan that we submitted and following through with any corrective actions that we identified. Um, some of the board policies that were put into the original comprehensive equ equity plan actually were not the right ones to align with the area. So we're going, I'm going back through the comprehensive equity plan to try to correct the policies that are listed just so that the next time we submit it, we don't have to go through that all over again. <laughs> They'll all be in there already. Um, so, and you know, so we'll review it, we'll realign it um, with the appropriate policies. So we will submit the statement of assurance by September 1st this year, uh, 2017, and then each year for the next two years to the state of New Jersey, um, we will also, we will submit next two years? Or is it just the next year, Scott? We submit for the statement of assurance for three years. And then we do the new comprehensive equity plan in 2019-2020. So it was a, a, mostly going through, and I'm not gonna go into all the details of like the specific areas of the plan, but once we get it all corrected, I will forward it out to the committee so that the, com uh, sorry, to the board, so that all board members have a copy of the comprehensive equity plan and will be able to read through cool. all the specifics once we get it all, all fixed. Um, <clears throat> All right, so um, the other piece that um, we sort of touched on briefly um, is conducting an annual needs assessment. Um, there's no directive from the state that we have to do an annual needs assessment. Um, it's something that you only have to do every four years when you actually submit the comprehensive equity plan. Um, but if we if we're going to be working on this plan each year, we'll be in a very good position to be able to look at what's going right and what's what we need to tweak in terms of the district overall. Um, so I think it would give uh, Scott and Jen Knapp good data and good information to be able to pour over um, in terms of looking at what the needs in the district are each of the years that we go through, rather than waiting every four years, like not doing it until that four-year period comes up. All right, so our affirmative action based on not this meeting, but the meeting before, um, Jen Knapp, uh, we didn't realize when the rollover of the uh, website occurred, the affirmative action information went bye-bye and accidentally was not reposted. So that's back up on the web. Jen um, worked with the tech folks and got that back up um, on our web. And she also has spoken with the middle school principal, uh, with Principal Owen and Principal Lassiter, and it will be printed into each of the student handbooks, um, which I guess it wasn't, that wasn't uh, something that was done previously. Uh, discussion that we had is it's better if students have the information up front it's in their manuals and they can find it easily. Um, and it'll help ensure that we're meeting federal mandates with uh, affirmative action. Don't worry, those are all going away anyway. I know. That's why I want it in the manual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Michelle already gave an update on the cultural competency audit. It was something that the equity committee was looking for information on, so thank you, Michelle for sharing that information with us in the curriculum report, because um, now I know. I did not know you were looking for it, but you're welcome. <laughs> I was. Um, 
Okay, and then uh, discipline study group did meet. I was unable to attend that meeting on May 30th. Um, I have not had a chance to follow up with Scott about it. Um, they were scheduled to discuss student-teacher relationships and discipline, and Scott indicated that they made some decisions about having these five hours of meetings. So I guess that's what you talked about. <laughs> Anything to add about the discipline study group? Besides that, no. Sorry. Okay. We had our two students showed up, and they are interested. Well, at least a junior is interested. Will be a senior next year, taking part in these dialogues. High school. Yeah. Okay. Restorative practices training has started with IIRP. That took place in May, and the trainings will resume again in September. But they will, and I didn't add in my presentation that the leadership team will be trained over the summer. We're actually going to have IIRP oh, right. come to us. And most of their training is going to be on reactive circles and working through discipline. Is so, that something that board members could sit on in uh, possibly? Potentially. I, you know, I do have, yes, potentially. Um, I do have the trainer who trained the teachers presenting to the board in July. So maybe we can ask her then if there's a board element to this. Uh, so she'll be here in July. And if you could ask about when they do the training, too, because I know when they did, um, when we first brought, what, touchstones into the district, and they came in and did a presentation to board members and, like, were able to attend that. And it was helpful. I mean, it's just helpful to kind of see how things work. So she'll dive into that uh, in July. I'll try not to get too much into my presentation mode so she could spend more time with you than I do talking about RP. Right. And the last thing is, um, well, Ann already mentioned the equity review of the policies, which I'm working on the database for. Um, you'll also see come up in the near future a recommended new policy, uh, which is uh, an addendum to our BOE policy 2260, Affirmative Action Program for School and Classroom Practices. Um, this new policy will be 2260.1 cultural competency. Um, it is uh, very similar, uh, based off of really the one that was passed in South Orange <coughs> Maplewood School District um, back in 2015, but it basically seeks to formalize a lot of the programs that we're working on, part of the things that are, uh, you know, this whole next year's PD, uh, a number of different initiatives that are, have been started. I'm sorry, I can't be more articulate. It's getting late. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. But it should probably come up in the July meeting. Okay. Nothing. All right, great. Uh, does anybody have any, anybody able to formulate any questions for Sharice? <laughs> okay. I, think if, uh, if I could just ask a question, like, considering that I gave information about text, not textbooks, it was, sorry, it's getting late. Um, books that were culturally relevant. Is there anything else that I should look out for in the curriculum committee <laughs> that might be crossover stuff or shared? Not, but I'll think more about that. Reach out to you in the next day or two. Okay. I'll be talking to Suzanne and Christina about the discussion we had earlier. Right about the writer's workshop. Well, about in general, the, the larger concern or need, want, and that's to keep everybody in the loop ahead of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, any programs that come up that are geared towards academic excellence. Excellence, okay. Through the committee. Um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say because it would be sort of, it could come up at any time. Right. I mean, the thing with the equity, is it's in everybody else's committees. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of hard to sometimes keep track of some of the things because pieces get discussed in different places. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I mean, my assumption was that you had heard about Dr. Daniel's findings. So uh, well, I, I knew that she had come and I knew that she had done a, a you know, review of the schools. But I never was able to get the information about what it was that actually she found. Okay. 
So is that just something that could be shared with yeah, there's a document. the board? Yeah, I actually shared it with the curriculum committee, but I'll follow up with the board. Okay. I'll send it to you tomorrow. Great. Okay. If no one else has anything um, for Sharice, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation. Is reserved this time for your comments. Yay! We have a bite. <laughs> <laughs> you are a very patient man, sir. He works with children. Uh, there was a there was a line. So. <laughs> Keith Presti, the HBEA president. Um, first, I'm just, and I'm sure you probably know, but I'm happy to report that uh, the HBEA has ratified the tentative agreement between the board and ourselves. Uh, and we are looking forward to the board doing the same next week. Um, and I do want to say that it was a really great process. Um, we were able to accomplish a lot of things in five meetings and get it all done before the end of the year, which is historic, I think, yep. here in Highland Park. Uh, so we'll be entering the school year fresh on a new contract, no retro pay or anything like that. So we're very happy about that. Um, and then I just wanted to make a note, uh, since there's a lot of policy discussion right now, um, and I was thinking especially uh, policies like the use of social networking, which you're saying is a new one, right? Correct? Sorry. You, or, okay, and I think the one that Rob was probably mentioning, I think was like communicating with students or something that yeah, yeah. had some controversy oh, yeah, prior yeah. to. That's right. <clears throat> it's just that, especially ones like this, you know, um, they have a huge direct impact to the staff. And um, so I, I just want to make a note of something that is in the contract. I know that they're online now. Um, and I'll just read this, it's very brief. It says, the, you know, the board will provide the association with a copy of its board policy manual and will continue to provide the association president with copies of changes in the policy when they become effective. So, yes, we can go access it, but there's, it's quite extensive. So, yes. especially when there's ones being changed or updated, um, if, I know this is first reading, then there'll be a second reading, and then when it, when it goes into effect, if, uh, if I could be notified so that then I can relay that to the membership and keep them updated. Because a lot of times it's like, oh, it's board policy, but it's like, where's that, board? what board policy? You know, there's, a, there's quite a few of them, so. Uh, yeah, let's try to figure out how we can do that. <laughs> you know, I we, mean, that should just, be, it sounds like that should just be standard practice, anything. Yeah, yeah. Get, get yeah. a copy it, of the night it's passed. Yeah, yeah. And aside from, you know, I, I'm here following along, but as, you know, aside from that, the the regular staff is not usually aware of the policies and as they're being changed and adopted. And it would be okay if we said, I mean, if we just, I, I, this sounds like glib, if we gave you a, like, you know, we just notified you, hey, the new agenda's up, we passed this list of policies. Because once you have the list, it's easy to look them up, right? Yeah, the yeah. Okay, so you, you just would want a list of like, this is what we passed as, tonight? As, as, as long as that, when, I, when they're, they'll be updated when I look them up on, I don't know how quickly oh, they're yeah, that's updated. that's true, right. I mean, we could say, like, wait five days. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how that process works. Scott, how long does it take for the policies to go from our adopting them to being online? I, I don't know. It's got to be at least a couple of weeks. It does not happen weeks? overnight. That I know. Uh, I, I'll find out. If it's so online. if there's final language um, when you vote it, on it, yeah, yeah. then I, I, I'm assuming that that'll be what's printed that day, or right, there unless could be changes. A, I mean, that's what I'm thinking. And then if, if it goes into effect immediately, then we kind of need that information immediately and not wait two weeks and right. then violate a policy that we weren't aware of. Well, it seems like it, the easiest thing would be once Susan has the change. I mean, I'm assuming once we do it, it goes back to Susan, and then Susan's the one who sends it to Strauss Esme. She can send it to, just copy to Keith me. just as easily okay, as that's she a good can idea. send it to Strauss right. Esme. Okay, I just was trying to figure out where the process And then you at least is. have a physical copy, and then you, you know within X amount of time it will be up on the website. Yep. So, Scott, you'll make sure that happens? Yeah, and that's so Susan, that we have to add Susan. that to that list you sent me. Yeah, 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 yeah to Susan's uh, yeah. responsibilities. Yeah. No, no, no. We'll, we'll talk later. That's okay. fine. Yeah. Great, that's good. You know, I wonder if... Um, I mean, it would make sense to give you guys some input, or at least to like inform us of any potential objections to this while we're considering. It. I didn't even think of it. I'm sorry, um, I, but like, I mean, do, would you want to like send me or Darcy or Scott or somebody an email with your thoughts about this? Before I mean, I could. I read through it. I didn't see anything that was didn't, and nothing that really stood out to me. Other, okay. know, it's pretty standard. Okay. You know, 
stuff. But um, when you're talking about social media, which is ingrained in everybody's lives yes. at this point, right. and then there's that, there's that line of like, I'm held to a different standard. It's important to know uh, not only you know what is a, a appropriate in, in the world, but what is this board's views on that, and so that we are adhering to that. This board's view is that the uh, the commissioner <laughs> of education's uh, sense of propriety is not the not the dividing line here. Right. Um, well, I mean, I guess you know you follow along the agendas. I mean, I, I I'm sure you already feel welcome, but I would invite you to feel even more welcome to uh, you know email us uh, if you take a look at one of these policies. Um, but, let me think actually, so I mean now you have access to the, you, you have access to all the, right, to all the policies on the board, uh, on the, on the board web, website. Right, the board documents for the meeting or yeah. whatever. Um, yeah, so I mean I guess you have a chance to look at them, just please do email us mm -hmm. or call us or something, you know, call the appropriate person. I'm the head of the policy committee, but you know, Darcy, Scott, whoever, um, because obviously like, you know, we're trying to, we revise this policy hev heavily and we're obviously trying to guess what is sort of fair and what actually represents a realistic view of a teacher's school day. Right. And, you know, we had a lot of like, well, what if the teacher's working on this? Or what if the teacher, you know, so it'd be good to hear from you. Great. Good. I'll, okay, I'll good. Just, I'll be in touch. Oh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. My list of Thanks, demands. <laughs> Thank okay. you. All right. I have nothing for my president's report because no one would be able to hear me right now anyway. Thank you. Um, <laughs> anybody have any old business? No. Anybody have any new business? No. I have one question. All right. No. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Throw something So, this, this, sorry. There's a um, National Summit for Inclusive Communities and Sustainable Regions at Rutgers University Camden on July 21st. Um, it is being run by Building One America. I have to look into them. Um, but the, the program is it's looking more broadly than just at schools. Um, it's looking at uh, communities as wholes, including issues with schools. Um, is this something that a board member could get approved to go to? Um, in terms of getting funded, the conference is $100, basically. Why don't you send it to me and Scott and Linda and we'll yeah. okay. Will do. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'm assuming that Keith doesn't want to get back up for public comment a second time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I will give a, um, sh a short version of what we're going to do now, which is um, instead of just adjourn, we are going to recess back into closed session um, to further discuss um, Dr. Taylor's evaluation because we did not get a chance to finish that up because we only had about 20 minutes of closed session. Um, there's just so much going on today. It's, we have a busy meeting. Um, so instead of just adjourning, we are going to recess back into closed and then um, we will have to come back out into open and actually adjourn the meeting. Um, when we come back into open, we are not going to have Chris stay here, um, so we will not come back on camera. For So for all of those of you at home, we are going to be gone for the evening, um, but we are going to uh, adjourn for a while back into closed, and then we will come back into open and close out the meeting until we meet next week on the 19th. So can I get a motion to uh, adjourn into closed session? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.